welcome to the stream. What we are going to be discussing today, oh, I should say welcome to season two as well. So this is a new season, new beginning. We had some break between the last season and this one. Jose is no longer going to be joining us on the show, tragically. But we have a lot of positive things as well. And what I'm going to tell you is the theme of this season is the Business Violence Network. Considering talking about the Business Crime Nexus, sorry, the Business Violence Nexus. And this is the reason why you are seeing this trippy uh, Esser Act on the screen. Uh, if you're an audio-only listener, if you've got this off Apple Podcasts, you're not going to see this. But what uh, is showing on the screen is a cube within a cube. And it's the smaller cube inside is moving towards you. And then it's getting bigger. And then you realize that the outside cube was actually inside of what you thought was the outer cube. Because what this is, is a four-dimensional cube. So there's, uh, I guess, six faces on a 3D cube. And what happens is that you've got a cube that's in a different space that's connected to this cube. And so you're going to have, uh, like, way more faces way more points and you can only see it with one perspective okay so this metaphor is uh you know kind of a pretentious and mathematical way of talking about the elephant that uh people on people they can't see they're each feeling a different part of the elephant they're seeing a different they're not seeing anything they're feeling a different part of the elephant and they are describing something long and smooth or they're describing something hairy, or they're describing a tree trunk if they're holding onto the leg, or if they're touching the belly, then uh, they're describing something else. And that is what the business violence nexus is. So you have the most respectable of all uh, activities, you know, engaging in business. The business of America is business. And then, of course, you have the most. Um, despised and uh hated of all you know the lowly uh criminal or whatever skulking through the night he's not you know uh providing any consumer goods to anyone he's just taking them away from you when you're not looking you know and so how can these things be related you know and so we're gonna be looking at it from different perspectives and what i'm hoping is that the way that i am um gonna be talking about John Wayne Gacy's uh, political connections is in such a way that it kind of shows you the rotation from someone who is engaged in aberrant violence. Uh, I don't think there's many people who, you know, seek to justify John Wayne Gacy's crimes on a basis of uh, sympathy or something. Uh, what... So what you would see is like this totally aberrant individual who belongs, um, uh, you know, who's just seen as like the, the pinnacle of someone who needs to be punished and contained. You know, uh, I think the people say that, oh, this is a guy a death penalty was made for or whatever. And, um, but what I'm going to be highlighting is his, uh, groundedness in the community the many people who worked with him in a business relationship or in the democratic party without really um uh questioning you know and 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 how do these things you know uh reconcile and basically the idea is that there's a, there's a business violence nexus that business requires violence uh either you know because of the tendency towards monopoly that that in the uh, imperialism highest phase of capitalism Lenin talks about uh 
you, you see that businesses compete and then violence becomes a part of that competition. And uh, he said something about, you know, we talked previously about the newspaper war in Chicago, the shooting war between competing newspapers. And there's also um, <clears throat> uh, Lennon talked about how basically cartels will try to keep people out of business with violence. Think about extorting small businesses. This is something that happens to uh, businesses is that they get extorted and they need protection and they either the person extorting them protects them or they have to seek someone else to protect them. And so this is a bit of a roundabout introduction because it's very hard to talk about a totally aberrant person, try to make them seem normal. Many people uh, view the Gacy case as a, uh, uh, a lens where they are not seeing things that threaten uh, their idea of um, the stability of society. And it's very threatening how integrated he was into the, the political machine in Chicago. And so I want to say uh, a preface, of course, that a lot of people, they take Gacy's um, crimes that he uh, sexually victimized men uh, and they they look at it from a homophobic lens, and uh, I I don't think that this is justified because if if anyone was homophobic, John Gacy was, and uh, he expressed extreme hatred for gay people in his life. So so viewing him as some example of a, of justification for homophobia is not legitimate at all. Uh, on top of this, true crime in general, you know the people talk about. Uh, are we sensationalizing these figures? Are we saying that, you know, these serial killers are ubermensch? Are they special? And uh, I'm not saying that at all. And I think that what uh, really it was shocking to me about John Gacy was how well integrated he was into society and what a well-functioning member of society he was while committing these crimes. And that there's even, you know, a case to be made that some of the violence that he did was integrated into uh, his his daily life that was considered socially acceptable by his neighbors, you know. And um, the other thing about true crime is a lot of people they talk about. Okay, true crime is about the victims, you know. What uh, what we care about are the victims. We're not we don't care about the the killers. And uh, on the one hand. Um, I think you're not supposed to call people victims. You're supposed to talk about survivors of abuse or survivors of uh, assault. And uh, there are survivors of, of John Wayne Gacy. And on addition to this, there are people who didn't survive. There are people who were killed. So do you call them victims? Uh, the current practice, I believe, is yes. So I'm going to uh, you know refer to them as the murder victims. And many of these people were very young. Uh, and I think, you know, it's not like it's good to go and kill older people, but there was, uh, there was an aspect of, of John Wayne Gacy's crimes that was deliberately preying on youth, offering youth job opportunities and money, acceptance, uh, a place to a sort of a clubhouse in his uh, suburban basement where they could drink and use drugs without being uh, disciplined. Uh, and there is an aspect of that. And he also impersonated an authority figure a lot to kidnap youth. And um, something very, very sick about taking advantage of the youth like that. And it doesn't mean that it's better to abuse older people or something, but just there's something wrong with, with taking advantage of the youth. And, and this was the main aspect of John Gacy's uh, violence, I think, that we should uplift. Uh, in terms of of relating violence against youth that he committed to the prevalence of uh, of hostility to youth and people taking advantage of the youth and uh, some of the murders were related to to uh, his wage theft of of his young employees 
Uh, but ultimately, you know, my view is not really to focus or center uh, John Wayne Gacy survivors or victims. Uh, we will talk about them some, but mainly I want to talk about the enablers that enabled his violence. And I think this is also important to, to face up to. And I think that, that in general, the, the true crime genre could grow by focusing on the enablers of violence as well, because uh, these people are certainly um, under uh, scrutinized. They're not scrutinized, they're not held accountable, and uh, we're gonna see that John Wayne Gacy enjoyed a lot of impunity. Uh, We had a little bit of technical difficulties here, but uh, yeah, basically, you know, this chill cube the YouTube viewers are looking at. I think that what I'm trying to communicate with this is that we are gonna be like looking at different aspects of John Wayne Gacy's social relationships, and uh, now that we're basically said the intro, you know, said my philosophy on true crime. Uh, I think what we're gonna try and do is go to the slideshow. Okay. Try and get this stuff up without too much havoc, hopefully. Okay. Got that up. Uh, let me just check audio. Okay, I got the audio, good. Uh, newspapers.com is a great resource so all right here's the slideshow and uh this was an audio format intended to be at one point you know what, let's just check check in that the levels again okay the levels are good the mic is recording uh here we are business violence nexus that's what we want to talk about season two the career of John Wayne Gacy is what we're talking about today. Well, uh, this is kind of like um, this diagram. Again, apologies to audio only listeners. This is again a hypercube. One face of the hypercube says business community. Another face of the hypercube says law enforcement slash counter insurgency. Another face says elected officials and their lackeys. And the final face says workers. And uh, I wanted to consider workers as not as, you know, special people, hard hats, sparks, whatever. Workers are basically everybody else who hasn't sort of been rolled into one of these uh, privileged, bourgeois, secret societies, for lack of a better word, societies of self-protection, societies of self-protection through violence uh obviously the law enforcement used violence to defend themselves the elected officials and the business community they use law enforcement which does violence uh i guess in a rosier view of things we would assume i guess you would assume they only do that and only with through the mechanism of the law but i think as we proceed through today's uh investigation we're going to see that there's also unilateral violence by elected officials and their lackeys there's unilateral violence by the business community and there's unilateral violence by law enforcement and counterinsurgency and these intersect and as you rotate the cube you're seeing one become the other you know it seems like the law enforcement is encasing the other two but as you rotate your point of view you'll see actually the business community is encapsulating law enforcement and the elected officials and then you rotate it more and you, and you see how the elected officials may become the most dominant in a certain view and so uh with the workers one thing i wanted to say about them is that you you see workers looking to accommodation appeasement finding ways to uh get some concessions and and a little bit of of what they need to survive 
and you see workers turning to social struggle and oppositional relationship with these other groups that uh, oftentimes ends in concessions, though also extreme violence and oppression. So this, this cube is rotating, and we want to talk about it, but it's so complicated, it's hard to see it all at once, this Tesseract. And uh, what happened on my slide? All right, there's a nice slide about building up the Tesseract from a point to a square, and then you kind of extrude the square out in three dimensions, you get the cube, and then in a fourth dimension, you kind of extrude the cube out. And so you've got a cube that seems bigger because it's closer to you in the third dimension, one that seems smaller because it's a little further away in the third dimension, but actually they're the same size in the whole 4D plane. Uh, so this picture I'm showing right here is a picture of Rosalind Carter and John Gacy shaking hands. This is a really famous one. I think a lot of these like crack.com articles and kind of uh, listicles and whatever, they'll say, whoa, isn't this wacky that Rosalind Carter shook hands with John Gacy and then the next week she took she shook hands with uh, 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 Joan, Jim Jones. And uh, yeah, it is pretty wacky. Uh, some of them get into the fact that the Secret Service cleared this interaction, uh, even though John Wayne Gacy did have a violent criminal record from Iowa at this point uh, for uh, rape of a under of an under 18 young man. Uh, content warning also to be aware there. I have avoided most of the descriptions of uh, sexual assault or crimes, but uh, in the middle, we're going to discuss Jeffrey Rignall and uh, how Gacy kidnapped him and how it's very obvious and how the uh, police pretty much ignored it and Gacy in, enjoyed a, a shocking amount of impunity inside of Cook County. Uh, so that's that's something to get out of the way that, that yeah, we're talking about a serial killer. I'm not going to be talking about his uh, sex acts that he committed directly. Uh, I'm going to talk about that as little as possible, but uh, there will be some traumatic aspects, uh, particularly once we get to the Jeffrey Rignall section. But yeah, this this picture, Secret Service cleared him. That's pretty weird. The other thing is that Rosalind Carter came to Chicago to make nice with the Chicago machine. And I believe this photo was from when Daly was alive. And she came to Chicago to make nice with Daly, who was sort of a kingmaker and a power broker in the National Democratic Party. Mayor Daly was a bad guy in some ways. Uh, his, his career has sort of a, a dupic or a double, you know, a kind of a, Gacy is almost his double or something like that because they both were kind of, uh, shy, uh, white ethnics who clawed their way to the top through, through, uh, some cunning, but mostly, uh, viciousness and deal-making daily clearly more uh together uh daily presided over the assassination of of fred hampton he he would have been he set up john burgess he set up who was a cop who went around murdering people uh he was a member i think we said in our chicago race riot episode he was in the hamburg club that went and did a pogrom against black people in the 1920s so he would have been like 20 years old when that happened daily was a really bad guy when martin luther king was killed he gave a shoot to kill order and a shoot to maim, like if you that the police should shoot any black person who is uh uh suspected of looting, they should shoot to maim, quote unquote, and then anyone suspected of arson shoot to kill. So Daly was a real scumbag and, and, and horrible for humanity. He slapped his name on all kind of uh uh architecture that business people made a fortune building through skimming that has kind of turned Chicago into this uh, super car dependent city of concrete boxes. Uh, that being said, though, he was the undisputed king of the Democratic machine. The reason Rosalind Carter was here was to make nice with him. Uh, here's Blandich, who was shaking hands with John Wayne Gacy in this picture. Uh, Blandich, after Daly died, 
became the successor after sort of a struggle of politicos within the Democratic City Council. So they kind of picked him to be the successor of Daly, kind of an interim guy. And this is um, this picture. Uh, you know, you want to see the picture of Daly shaking hands with Gacy. As far as I can tell, it's not out there. But this is also like an interesting picture. I would say maybe more interesting than the Rosalind Carter one because uh, here this guy is at a uh, in a flux, right? Power flux. Uh, he's the interim guy. He's trying to, you know, consolidate power, or get something out of it, I guess. So, and here he is shaking hands with Gacy at this time. So, here we are. You know, we after all the blathering. Hopefully, uh, I try to keep the chit chat to ten minutes or less. I like to get to the point. You know, uh, when I'm listening to podcasts, I like to see him get to the point. But the point is that John Gacy was a precinct captain. And this means what exactly? Uh, we are going to refer to Mike Royko to kind of explain how this worked. But uh, basically, this is kind of like the jumping off point for mapping the network of Democratic Party officials. And I should say also that, you know, in Illinois, the Democratic Party is extremely reactionary. They're they're extremely pro police, and uh, you know historically white supremacist against integrating housing. It's one of the worst. You know when Daly was, uh, I think Martin Luther King said something about Chicago was more vicious than the uh, South. I think at the '68 convention in Mike Royko's book, they talked about um, Daly honoring uh, Bull Connor. Uh, by either shaking his hand on stage or letting him give a special uh, keynote address. But, you know, the, the Democrat, Chicago is a Democratic Party fiefdom. That doesn't mean that, like, the Republican Party is better or where the Republicans are in charge, that, you know, it's exactly the same. It's just that's they're the ones who boss this area and they have a whole apparatus set up to do it. And it's uh, the fact that, you know, it, 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 when you see how the Democratic Party behaves locally on local issues that they are actually in charge of deciding, they're as reactionary, as cruel to, uh, et, to, to black people, uh, you know, Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, to poor people, as penny pinching, as, uh, you know, ableist as the Republicans are where they're in control. And really, the, it's just sort of kind of like the tendency to monopoly or whatever that that you, you get one party that is kind of the boss of an area and, and they grease the wheels of capital and, and they kind of make the decisions on uh, in the situations where capitalists uh, would be fighting with each other or competing in a way that threatened the stability of the whole system. And then in other areas, the Republicans do that. But John Gacy was a precinct captain. That means that at a polling site, he was basically in charge of turning out the vote. Uh, and uh, what typically happens in a uh, machine ward is that you got a list of all the supporters in the area and you check them off, each of them, as they show up to the polls. Uh, I was actually a precinct captain. I'm not going to talk too much about my personal life, but uh, I didn't have this ward list or whatever. I didn't have uh, all the kind of apparatus that that a machine captain did uh, so some of the machine captains did show up with this stuff uh and i sort of saw they greeted like every single person that voted they they like talked to them and then shared some personal fun homie with them so uh basically to explain it a little better we're gonna go to the great uh mike royko who is a journalist who wrote with a barbed pen a lot of acerbic criticism of the chicago machine over the years he wrote a book called Boss about Richard J. Daly, which I read in preparation for this episode. Not to uh, brag too much. But um, here you see kind of like the Ur machine boss, Vito Marzullo. So this is someone that in the present day, I still hear people talk about with a sense of awe and wonder and fear. 
that this person became very, very powerful in the city. Uh, let's hear him explain the... Oh, well, that's after he died. Here is sort of... Um, the city council decided to have a resolution to uh, honor him. So we'll just read that out loud. Uh, this is from... I, I credited the blog. It's N-A-L-E-R-T dot blogspot.com. I appreciated this. They said that... They, they pointed out that the city council honor him in 1990, even after uh, it had been revealed that the FBI had put him on a list of members of La Cosa Nostra. Uh, so they said here, whereas throughout his political career... Vito Marzullo cared for and represented his neighbors and constituents as if an extension of his family and made their concerns his own, whereas Vito Marzullo's devotion to his constituents was rewarded by their loyalty, demonstrated in the fact that in his 20 elections to political office, he ran without opposition 19 times. Okay, well, that's a hint as to what his power, like, consisted of. It was largely out of the unseen parallel political connections it wasn't about winning elections in every time some contender came up to try and knock him down and 19 out of 20 times he doesn't have any opposition whereas Vito Marzullo is survived by his loving wife Letizia their six children 19 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren and whereas Vito Marzullo was held in high esteem by his colleagues who conferred on him the honorary title of dean of the city council as much out of personal affection and respect for his wisdom and counsel as for his many years of diligent service. So basically they said he was second only to Daly, and basically he would decide what's going to happen, uh, what legislation is going to be passed. Oftentimes, you know, the legislation is a smokescreen for what the actual intention is, you know, which is usually to make money off of some scheme. Uh, so he, basically he was second only to Mayor Daly. I forgot to mention this. Mayor Daly in the Mike Royko book is said that he reviewed a list of every single new hire to the city every day. So, and, and they had a like a dossier on each new hire to the city that Daly personally reviewed during you know a few hours he set aside for this. So the idea part of the 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 machine was that uh, if you wanted to work for the city at this time and you know it's changed a bit now it seems more like it's a lot more independent contractors and stuff working for the city but you can see it reflected in how they try to crush the teachers union and and crush various public sector things privatize things and get independent contractors in to uh replace these kind of lifelong workers but basically uh there's kind of job to get a job at all you've got to vote for the machine and you've got to be not on the shit list of mayor daly who's going over all the hires uh to um get a sweetheart job basically you've got to be influential and then there's all these jobs where you just get paid and it's no show and then uh you're expected to kind of kick up part of your income to the party and to you know turn out the vote and they're gonna replace you uh or take away your special job, no-show job, if you're not doing that. So, uh, the people of the city of Chicago, this is from the legislation again, are grateful for the good fortune of having been enriched by the hard work, humor, and dedication, which were the hallmarks of Vito Marzullo's public service. Now, therefore, be it resolved, honor the life, mourn his passing. Uh, Alderman Solis moved to suspend the rules temporarily. To permit immediate consideration of an action upon the foregoing proposed resolution. So he was the alderman from Vito Marzullo's ward after Vito Marzullo. Uh, this at the time Solis got elected. This was becoming a majority Mexican ward. Vito Marzullo was Italian. Uh, alderman Solis has been disgraced by having his uh, phone calls requesting Viagra from. Uh, political cronies and business people he was requesting recommendations for bordellos and viagra and other things on the phone taps uh for some reason he's not currently in jail despite having had all this hoopla around him uh yeah alderman burke seconded by alderman shaw the lease 
blah, blah, blah. Proposed resolution was adopted by a rising vote. So Burke is another real snake of the city council uh, who is, um, again, also supposed to be getting prosecuted. Uh, somehow that didn't work out. I think sort of related to COVID. Uh, yeah, and so this Vito Marzullo kind of uh, was very eloquent and concise, but spoke in a very down-to-earth way. Uh, oh, we lost some slides. We lost the slide where we talk about Mike Royko describes Vito Marzullo in a passage that he would have a judge walk behind him like two steps when he was walking around, and then the judge would come up and open the door for him and stuff. And this was a judge that he put on the bench. So that's like pretty wild. It's kind of like medieval or whatever. You know, there's something a little bit special about Chicago that it seems like everything is more in flux. And so that, that people do kind of fall back on these uh, medieval rights and privileges and norms. It seems like people are always fighting for to preserve norms that uh of of their regular people you know the right to do certain things you know uh calling dibs on your parking spot is one example a particularly anti-social one but there's other stuff that's like that kind of pushing the limits as a honorable thing to do to preserve those rights for your neighbors and people in your similar social position you know you see things changing a lot uh very rapidly in the city and and power that the, the struggle for power is very out in the open and uh i think that this aspect leads to doing stuff like having a like a judge walk behind you like your page or vassal or whatever and so what he just said about his political power i got an assistant state's attorney and i got an assistant attorney general i got an electrical inspector at twelve thousand dollars a year and I got street inspectors and surveyors and a county highway inspector. I got an administrative assistant to the zoning board and some people in the secretary of state's office. I got 59 precinct captains and they all got assistance and they all got good jobs. The lawyers I got in jobs don't have to work precincts, but they have to come to my ward office and give free legal advice to the people in the ward. So yeah, let me go back and kind of reiterate maybe what I was saying less clearly earlier that the machine is basically daily at the top then are the ward committee men the ward committee men are um uh <clears throat> for all the uh wards in chicago i think it's something like 50 or to 100 probably gonna get uh roasted for not knowing uh then these guys are in charge of getting out the vote making sure they win elections they're gonna get disciplined if they don't get out the vote for the stuff that is wanted. These guys are operating at the level where they are like getting picked for candidates or they're influencing who gets picked to be a candidate on the Democratic ticket, which was something that Daly and probably, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, this guy Keen and like a handful of his cabal, they kind of picked all the candidates unilaterally. And this was sort of how they exercised power. Then the ward committee men they've kind of got to control their ward control the uh the ward committee men and the aldermen kind of like two sides of the coin alderman is a city council person that's what we call it in chicago and uh they kind of regulate they're kind of like regulators in their ward in a way uh they've got to get out the vote but they also have a bunch of jobs that's basically what he's talking about is that all of these jobs are jobs that vito marzullo gets to decide who works in them and he wants to reward people who bring out votes for the Democrats, people who are, uh, you know, I'm going to say, making money in a way that's beneficial to his associates, whether, you know, of illegal or illegal or clandestine or open or gray market or black market. It could be any combination of those things, openly defying the law, clandestinely following it even. Who knows? But basically what he's saying is that all of his precinct captains, they have assistance to help them because they're working on doing stuff every day, like thinking about what's going on in the ward 
and how can they manipulate it to their advantage uh there's like a anecdote i remember hearing in college class i think about a, a shaman in the amazon and he said like his his whole job was uh tripping and thinking about what's going on in the jungle and trying to control it and basically i guess you could look at these precinct captains as kind of bad shamans they're trying to influence the flow of money votes uh attitudes and beliefs in the neighborhood towards the goals of the democratic party the chicago machine again not like it doesn't matter it's a democratic party it's like a it's it's a party of capitalists seeking their own advantage exercising uh, power for the purpose of of making money uh in some ways friendly to business unions but not even really over time so let's see now uh hopefully you have an idea in some respects of of what the chicago machine is like the ward committeeman is very powerful they're the bad shaman they're thinking about what are people thinking about in my neighborhood and how can i control them so uh we want to mike royko in his book said something like there are uh uh hold on we're taking a quick break All right, we just took a little break there. Uh, yeah, right here I have the same kind of house resolution honoring Robert Martwick when he's retiring. I think Marzullo died in the saddle. Uh, that's probably something that'd be good to fact check. Um, but basically, what are they saying here? And why are we reading it? So Robert Martwick was John Gacy's ward committeeman. Mike Royko said in his book that if you're from a weak ward, that Daly doesn't care about. He's not going to reward you at all. You're not going to... Uh, he said something about the ward committeeman is supposed to write a letter. If you want to go and be a candidate for a judge, you're supposed to write a letter to the Democratic Party endorsing you. And he told a story about a ward committeeman from a weak ward. He said, you want me to write a letter for you? I'm trying to become a judge, and I can't get anywhere because the Democratic machine doesn't care about me. So, essentially, we want to assess the, the main... The, the blue-pilled ideology is that Gacy was just a self-promoter he was a obnoxious man who kind of just insinuated himself into circles of important people to feel important sort of like uh you know someone who shows up at uh public meetings and asks a really uh uh boisterous question you know but nobody really pays attention to them or cares about them right and so the, the first problem with that is he's got the title. He's a precinct captain. So why is Robert Martwick going to give him, make him a precinct captain if, uh, if he's just some blowhard that nobody cares about? So later on, Martwick says that, oh, well, he volunteered to help clean up my offices and to set up events and stuff. So it was nice just having somebody come and set up. But being a precinct captain is not uh, just like a labor of love it's it's a very lucrative position in certain wards and we want to know if Gacy was a precinct captain who had juice who had clout who was um uh basically someone who was in with these people in a meaningful way or if he was just a blowhard and a braggart who liked to feel important and they just kind of played along with him because i guess he was willing to volunteer and then you know you set you put that together with all well he did all the murders in his spare time and he uh he hid it from everyone because everybody nobody wanted to really be cool with him or get to know him because he was such a loser so you kind of get this very reductive muck it's not the hypercube we want the hypercube okay we want to see this thing rotating we're seeing the connections we're seeing it clearly okay we're we're the good shaman we're seeing uh the forces the evil forces at work clearly uh, just seeing some muck of this guy's a loser and 
nobody knew he was a murderer so they just played along out of a general spirit of being nice that is the prevailing quality in our society you know uh that's not a very realistic picture of life in in chicago or in the united states or unfortunately probably about in most of this world nowadays you know a lot of it's about money and power not so much about um you know taking advantage of people's kindness uh, occasionally aberrant individuals do that whereas most people are just enjoying each other's kindness I, that's not really how life works so long story short story long you want to know how much juice Robert Martwick had because if Robert Martwick the ward committeeman had juice that means that being Robert Martwick's precinct captain meant that you had juice of a sort and so uh, I'm just going to describe my impressions. I imagine someone more versed in the Chicago politics and the Chicago history could come at me with election results and um, uh, things I hadn't considered. I researched this for a few weeks, so I think I unearthed some interesting stuff, but at the same time, I could be off base. But anyway, let's get into the what we found out. So uh, Robert Martwick... Went to high school and college, good for him. Went to law school at DePaul from Chicago. He worked as an adjunct professor and tutored former Chicago mayor Richard M. Daly and former Illinois Senator Howard Carroll. He also served as an assistant state's attorney in Cook County State's Attorney's Office, where he and his trial partner tried 59 felony jury trials. He was a candidate for Illinois State Rep in 68. In 1973, he founded the law offices of Finkel and Martwick with his partner, Norman Finkel, with whom he practices today. He also served in the Norwich Village Prosecutor. And then uh, it's cut off. But so that's a certain amount of influence, right? That he was honored by his colleagues, I guess. And that I guess he uh, happened to have a personal relationship with Daly after a fashion, you know? Uh, running down the connections in this law firm, running down uh, his prosecutorial career. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you do to write a book. And uh, it might be worth writing a book about this guy. I don't know. But uh, importantly, let's talk about the jobs. So as Vito Marzullo pointed out, his pride and joy is the jobs that he is able to give out to his cronies so what kind of jobs and more importantly what does mike roikos have to say about martwick and relatedly he has to say that this guy hired a bunch of his family and friends to uh no show low show jobs make work jobs so mike roiko wrote an article the ties that bind and uh we're gonna just read through it to an extent okay there is nothing that mayor richard j daly's machine likes better than a family man so the machine should be very pleased with richard martwick who was elected in 1970 as the cook county superintendent of schools mr martwick has shown that he is a real family man by loading his payroll with members of his family he also has provided well-paying jobs for many of the people who helped him in his upset victory among the relatives found to be on his administrative payroll are his wife, Marianne Fogarty Martwick. She is listed as an administrative assistant at 9804 a year. So uh, Marzullo felt that $12,000 a year was worth remarking upon. So the salaries are different back then. I mean, obviously, if you make $9,000 a year in 2022, you're well below the poverty line. But in, in 1970 or so, uh, it's kind of hard to judge how much money that was. I think there is a different amount of inequality. So being on the lower end of the distribution could have been even like not like you, you would be middle class even if you're in the some of the lower percentiles of income because the, the spread is less. And, but if you know what I mean. Anyway, so he hired his brother-in-law, Joseph Fogarty, $13,000 to a minister high school equivalency test that sounds like a low show job uh eugene weir his uncle ten thousand dollars as a truant officer for the cook county oh i should say richard martwick is robert martwick's brother so the fact that richard martwick has got this job shows that robert martwick has some influence to get 
Richard into a job that is generating even more jobs. So his aunt is getting $9,000 as an auditor. Relatives listed on Martwick's professional staff include 28 people. Office employs 65 people. And he has limited authority over Cook County suburban schools. Uh, Martwick offered these explanations of his relatives' qualifications and duties. My wife was my campaign manager. You should see the time she and I leave this office as late as 8 p.m. So Martwick is paid $29,600 a year, and his wife draws $9,800 a year. So I'm just going to go ahead and add an extra digit on all these things. So Martwick was making $290,000 a year in uh, $2020, I'm going to say, and his wife was making $90,000. Uh, shortly after the Martwicks were married, about five months ago, a reporter found Mrs. Martwick sitting at her desk writing thank you wedding notes while watching a soap opera on a desk TV. I mean, it's pretty cool. It's kind of a funny thing that, um, like, leftists kind of admire the old machine jobs because it's like, can we even imagine, like, getting something, like, like getting an easy job out of, like, political involvement? It's, like, so hard to imagine nowadays that everybody loves the uh the idea of graft and the political machine and patronage but uh there's quite an uglier side of it there's a lot of racism associated because people kind of defend these jobs uh these low show no show jobs they defend them based on uh like you know the kind of feudalistic thing the territorial defense of the homeland you know stuff blood and soil stuff there's a lot of that mixed up in the machine too all right so 68 and 25 that's a lot of jobs so mike royko wrote about richard martwick uh what did he say anything about robert martwick in here here we go martwick who has no advanced degrees in education and who had administered nothing bigger than a high school athletic department was put on the ticket as a replacement so that's called getting slated and if you read that royko book read all about the many struggles over who is going to get slated because for certain things if you get slated on the democratic party you're definitely going to get elected and uh so what does superintendent martwick say my brother put in a good word for me so martwick incidentally uh had become uh athletic director of ridgewood high school in norwich when his brother was a member of that school's board okay so robert martwick the ward committeeman uh Got his brother his first job as athletic director in a high school, and then he got him slated to be the superintendent. So Martinwick denies that anybody in his office was hired through political or family quality. And that, he says, includes Louis Farina, uh, who used to run the city's parking lots and later became famous when he designed a magnificent military uniform he wore as a commander of the city's meter mains. The uniform won him the nickname El Supremo. Arena, a City Hall favorite, is now on Martwick's staff at an $18,000 a year salary. But Martwick insists, none of my people are patronage employees. All of my people are highly, highly qualified. Everyone has to fill out an application. It is good that all of these friends and relations happen to be highly qualified, and their applications were accepted by Martwick. Now they can see each other every day. People shouldn't wait until funerals and weddings to have family reunions. Pretty funny. It's pretty dry, acerbic wit of the great Mike Royko. Uh, I think um, he kind of comes at it from this kind of uh, liberal reformer perspective that, oh, well, all the people in the jobs, they should be professionals. And, you know, I think with hindsight, we realize that professionalizing these patronage jobs led to uh, bad outcomes like that. Now there's a CEO of CPS instead of a superintendent and their whole shtick is cutting jobs. You know, so you can't really imagine like, being professional what does it mean to be professional like uh it means that you're you're working really hard at some goal and achieving it okay well the goal is what money so you can't really quantify like encouraging the youth and educating them in terms of money so they just want to cut jobs and you know get the same you know make the schools run for less and that's a win that's professionalism so you know the 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 liberal route of like reform is not ideal, but this, uh, the patronage jobs, we shouldn't romanticize them in some kind of 
raunchous way that we need to go back to the patronage jobs. But, you know, this goes to show also, like, the main thing we're looking at is how much juice did Martwick have, Robert Martwick, the ward committeeman. And uh, the answer is kind of a lot. You know, he got... The other thing that, that Royko talked about was that uh, when people get fired from one patronage job, once they're exposed, you want to move them to another patronage job to keep it in the family and show loyalty and stuff. So uh, Royko's got another pretty funny article hooking Richard Mortwick. Uh, Martwick? I don't know how to say it. Mortwick is Cook County's bane. And this, this one was kind of funny. He makes fun of the spelling. Aula Matzik, a suburban teacher, recently wrote a letter to Richard Martwick, the Cook County School Superintendent. Dear Super Martwick, I hold an elementary K-9 teaching certificate and I'm currently teaching fourth grade in Wheeling School District 21. I would like to have my... Uh, blah, blah, blah. So he responded, please show your transcripts to the personal department, which is misspelled. Uh... Martwick's office has been widely hailed as the most useless governmental office in all of Cook County. And concerning how many useless agencies we have around here, that is no small distinction. At election time, newspapers usually endorse one candidate or another for the various public offices, but when they get to Martwick, who is an elected official, they don't make any endorsement. Instead, they urge that the office should be abolished. Yes, this is something I wanted to, to mention, is that in, I think this is from the 90s, there's this mo movement to abolish the position of Richard Martwick. So that shows like it's a, if you're if the reformers are trying to just get rid of your position, that kind of shows us you probably were pretty influential in the Democratic Party to get there. So Martwick, who is a political hack, used the office to employ 50 or 60 of his political cronies and relatives to shuffle useless papers. Martwick, and they don't even shuffle the papers well. They're always losing records and sending things to the wrong schools. The Burma school officials say that Martwick is a bumbling nuisance and that education should be improved if his office ceased to exist. Uh, he sent another letter to Mark who said I've taken the liberty of marking the errors in your reply I find it very distressing that you would employ an individual who is so lacking in basic spelling punctuation and proofreading schools, skills to answer your mail uh, I used the reply as a proofreading exercise in my classroom that's cool I'm not about all that grammar correction and whatnot. But it's kind of cool. I feel like it's kind of a political lesson. It's from this reformist lens of let's all put the best people in office. Let's get the smart people in charge. Kind of a uh, whack. You know, you got to get with that communism stuff. You know, we got to put the workers in charge. The, the workers empowered with class consciousness, not just, you know, kind of tamed by patronage and, you know, uh, personal loyalties. Like in the machine. So uh, she said, Megan was able to find and correct all of the errors. Unfortunately, she's only 10 years old, but I could have had her call your office when she reaches age 16. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so Royko got involved, called the Royko's office. The woman who answered the phone snapped. I think this is a ploy by the media to exacerbate something. Do you know how to spell exacerbate? Of course I do. And you're trying to make a big issue out of nothing. That's pretty funny. Uh, so would they have spelled exacerbate wrong? All right, this is important. Martwick was part of the Verdoliac 29. I think that's what it was called. But basically, they elected the first black mayor of Chicago, Harold Washington. And he was planned to make... Uh, he, he had a lot of sort of populist reforms, kind of in your Allende-type mold. Uh, you know, uh, like, 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 uh, he, he came up with having these IPOs. So instead of the democratic political organization, which was the organization with the ward boss, you would have a more open group called the IPO, the independent political organization. And that's kind of what put him in power. So it was a real people power movement. Um, it was after it was in the eighties, uh, after, you know, the vicious, uh, uh, era of like the 70s type counterinsurgency, the beating up the people at the 68 convention, putting down the riots, shoot to kill, killing Fred Hampton, all this, this backlash, white backlash. 
in the 70s civil rights washington got in and the uh a group of all white city council people led by verdoliak who was called fast eddie and and later went to jail for stealing millions of dollars uh or got prosecuted i don't know if he went to jail or not but he got prosecuted for embezzling money from some government contracts and uh he became the leader of this white backlash faction and Martwick supported them. Uh, he's quoted in the newspaper, Robert Martwick, a veteran committeeman from Northwest suburban Norwood park township that he doubts that Washington could offer more than Verdoliak. What could Washington offer a guy in the suburbs? Martwick asked. I don't know of anything he could offer us. And I can say with all sincerity that I think Verdoliak has displayed the finest leadership qualities of anybody we've had as party chairman. So that tells you that uh, throughout that, that, that tells you that in 82, he had a very reactionary position to associate himself to this uh, white backlash guy, Verdoliak. And uh, like I said, we're on the hypercube. We're looking at the political and it's not all political. It's more like that this, these groupings of people they they spread outwards just from the politician to business people to law enforcement to to social trends and basically aligning with this guy it it kind of shows that you're like a white backlash chicago guy uh in that uh you're in you got you're in with this you know so this is what martwick said about gacy uh John Gacy, I'm reading about in the newspapers, is not the same John Gacy that I thought I knew. That Robert F. Martwick, a committeeman in the Norwood Park Township Regular Democratic Organization. He was always available for any chore, Martwick said, washing windows, setting up chairs for meetings, playing clown for kids at the organization's picnics and Christmas parties, even fixing someone's leaky faucet or rehanging a crooked door. So he always tried to be friendly, he said. I don't know anybody who didn't like him. So this is the line that you get about Gacy's political uh, position is that he was a wannabe, he was a people pleaser, he just went and kissed asses and people humored him. Uh, and I, I think that uh, I'm not going to say that there are people like that. I don't think there's people who are just losers and ass kissers or whatever, but you can see that there are uh, people who are in the political orbit that they they have oftentimes very naive ideas about the influence of what they're saying and their opinions uh they aren't precinct captains and they aren't precinct captains for the war committee men with juice and that's not what that's not what gacy was that uh he was more than this uh <clears throat> he was more than just like uh like a, a wannabe you know that uh uh we're gonna get into his company and stuff but basically uh this martwick guy had like it sounded like close to 100 jobs or at least richard martwick had like it said they said like 80 jobs or so i think it was like 29 and 60 something like that and so robert martwick and then he's saying oh well my brother put in a good word for me so this robert martwick guy has clout and he's not going to have a, a precinct captain that is just there to, uh, you know, just, just for the hell of it. Um, the other thing also is that, um, yeah, that's basically it. Yeah, he's not going to make Gacy a precinct captain. And we're going to look closer at Gacy in a minute. So Robert Martwick's career, he was a prosecutor. He was assistant state's attorney. Starting in 1962, he went private. Then 1969, uh, he became a war committeeman. Uh, he's kind of, I, I've kind of looked up all of the, I tried, Robert Martwick, I looked up every article on newspapers.com kind of sequentially. And I tried to skim them and see who was the actual Mark, Robert Martwick and who wasn't. So this, if this is not the same Robert Martwick, it's like the only other Robert Martwick that made it into the newspaper around this time in Chicago. So, uh, a dog obedience act will be presented by Robert Martwick and Stuart Trader and a musical combo from York Community High. So there's a few 
articles about how Robert Martwick was really into dog shows and dog training. So, uh, what the trajectory of this podcast is towards the program to kill thesis, right? That, uh, you know, they're hypnotizing these serial killers and winding them up, and then they are carrying out uh, uh, murders with uh, political and economic benefits to their masters, in addition to uh, being very psychologically excused. Uh, I mean, you know, Gacy wasn't a nice guy. He was real homophobic and, and real cruel and bullying in the descriptions of his uh, violence. You see that even with some people that that were able to subdue him you could see that he uh he's a cruel man you know so i'm not trying to pat him on the back but you know here's this guy robert martwick and uh into dog obedience you know kind of a hypnosis vibe there just putting that out there that's a part of the hypercube i wish i would have um introduced it a little differently i liked how the uh return of the oppressed guy gets very philosophical and evocative in his introductions but i meant to say something about can we really like we can't see we can't like you know there's all these dots there's all these points of data that are part of the hypercube of the business violence nexus and some of them it's hard to tell if it's noise or signal or what but this guy was training dogs he got on the newspaper about it kind of interesting so another thing that was kind of interesting sort of more of this evocative vibes based stuff he as a defense attorney before he got into the politics got quoted in this article about introducing cameras into squad cars pretty big technological development in the uh 60s between 62 and 69 uh i, I wish i had all the dates of this article i'm working on my podcasting setup I want to get all the, like, probably I need another monitor or something. But uh, it says he is giving a kind of uh, uh, a defense attorney's take on cameras and squad cars that's sort of splitting the baby or whatever. A defendant has to affirmatively give his consent, Martwick said. The tapes also could create a carnival atmosphere in the courtroom. However, there are instances where a videotape actually would help the defendant such as when there is a question as to whether he actually violated the law. So he's given the defense attorney's perspective. I would say overall, this quote is in support of the cameras and squad cars and his objections are kind of uh, quaint. For instance, oh, the defendant has to consent to being filmed by the squad car camera. Like that idea is so funny nowadays that you would have to consent to police surveillance in this way. But I guess back then it, he was thinking that way as a defense attorney. But it seems like the fact that so he's kind of like leading with his questions and concerns, but then at, and he's at the end, he's kind of consolidating that, uh, that maybe that cameras in the squad cars are a good idea. So this is again, vibes based speculation. But maybe he has some positive relationship with the police or whatever that he's commenting on new police technologies and uh, in an article that is pro you know probably kind of planted to get her get it uh, introduced you know and promote the idea kind of that's how propaganda works right the police seed these articles to promote their new technologies. Uh, yeah, I mean that's about that's about how it works. So he was a part of some very very early propaganda. So now let's go to Gacy. So Martwick nominated Gacy for a position on the Norwood Park Township Street Lighting District. Gacy became secretary treasurer in 1975 and 1976. He filed ethics statements. Oh, this is from a book called The Man Who Killed Boys, Clifford Leindecker. Uh, I did most of my research here. Uh, I read Sullivan's book and I read um, Amirante's, some of Amirante's books, some of Sullivan's book. I found this book had a lot of the uh, big picture stuff and a lot of the, the facts of that were very useful. And uh, I think he did a lot of the research in newspapers. So um, there's a certain academic quality to it that helps you see, you know, forgetting the ground. I, I felt it was very grounding in the in the basics of the story. But anyway, so his ethics statement, Gacy's ethics statement, 
disclosed that a sidewalk was installed by PDM painting, decorating, maintenance count contractors. That's Gacy's company that he owned. And, uh, he said in the, I watched the Gacy tapes, Netflix thing. And he said, uh, that it also stood for Polish daily maintenance. So he had a humorous name for it. I guess people teased him about being Polish in these political circles. So a sidewalk was installed by PDM for the Norwood park township road and bridge department at a cost of 3,500. So our rough calculation from saying that the superintendent of schools is making 29,000, that's probably 250,000, 3,500, we're going to say that's like 30,000. Okay. So, um, while police were preparing to scrutinize records, a former employee tipped them off to watch for evidence of kickbacks to contractors who referred remodeling jobs to PDM. He claimed Gacy padded his bills to finance the payoffs. So uh, an employee of PDM says that Gacy was padding contracts. I don't know how much it costs to put in a sidewalk, whether that's a lot of money at that time. But, you know... This, I think this is like in the sorrows and stuff. This is a part of the political machine too. these getting contracts for your business and stuff. To me, this kind of says he's playing with the big boys. And even if they want to tease him a lot and, and denigrate him and treat him like a wannabe, maybe even in their minds, they believed he was a wannabe. They gave him the money, you know, he got cut in on the construction contract. Oh, another thing, uh, that he did was that he plowed he got the snow plow contract some of these newspaper articles talk about that oh he was a he volunteered to plow but it's like a chicago thing that that you can get paid in the winter to plow the streets and uh it's like a hustle that that people get i, I talked to one person who had it they didn't mention that they got it from the alderman or whatever but i think it's pretty much like you gotta get the alderman to give you that job and, or the ward committee men. Often they're the same person. I think Vito Marzullo was both. So Gacy. So this is. Now we're getting into the business side of things. Uh, Gacy subcontracted 25 or 30 drugstore remodeling jobs with Ted Gladson. A respected contractor from the far Chicago suburb. Operator of p &E Systems in Lyle. Gladson specialized in drugstore and supermarket jobs. So... Uh, this, this guy gave Gacy 25 jobs and, uh, he was pretty rich. It seems like based on what I found about him in the newspapers. And again, this show is like, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about it in a minute. So, uh, one of the stores he remodeled was the Kazaziek pharmacy on Chicago's Southwest side. So the owner later observed that although pharmacists try to guard against theft, it would be possible for someone to help themselves to handfuls of drugs. Uh, some of the survivors said that like Gacy pulled out like, uh, like, a, like a bunch of bottles of pills and stuff that he was on pills all the time, getting high on Valium and stuff. He actually got high on some pretty, uh, exotic stuff an exotic amphetamine called, uh, Preludin and another exotic uh, downer that they found in the search warrant. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, he was he was getting drugs from these pharmacy jobs too, in addition to whatever money he was making. Uh, what's it say here? Guys, see jobs traced for linked to victims. So here in the newspaper, it says that Ted Gladson, PE Systems, and Lyle. Uh, he talked to the investigators about the employees that he referred to Gacy. Uh, and there's a question about uh, youths lured to Gacy's house with offers of jobs and marijuana and Valium. Uh, another far one of the pharmacists, he told his attorney that one of the pharmacists that he he worked with and that where a, a youth disappeared from that pharmacy an employee of the pharmacy disappeared and, and they think gacy killed him uh he said that oh well the the pharmacist was talking to me about some marijuana and getting some marijuana so uh i don't know if that's just gacy's bullshit i'm not trying to slander people or whatever especially people who are alive uh this was something that gacy told sam amirante and amirante put in his book so sue him so uh 
Gacy's house was searched. Among the items found were jars of pills containing powerful drugs, most of which cannot be obtained legally without a prescription. So again, the exotic amphetamines and the exotic uh, benzos. Not uh, there is, and there is another hypnotic, which was like a very exotic barbiturate. Uh, I think they call it tapes, but now it has a different name now. The attempt by investigators to question you sent by Gladson to work for Gacy as part of an effort to learn everything possible about Gacy in preparation for the murder trial. In addition, the Illinois Department of Law Enforcement, acting at the request of the Cook County State's Attorney, has sent two agents to Waterloo, Iowa. Um, uh, yes, that, that's where he was in the JCs. So other agents will attempt to collect information about Gacy in Springfield, where he lived for about two years. Yes, yeah, so he was in Springfield, Illinois, too. Unfortunately, we're not going to get to today. I think we're going to have to have a follow-up episode about Gacy. As loath as I am to uh, not move on. So this guy, Ted Gladson, uh, went to... His peer, I, again, I, this is the same kind of situation where uh, looking through the newspapers, it's possible there could be multiple Ted Gladsons. But this Ted Gladson was the president of PE Systems, so this is the same one. He's going to pharmacist conventions, and he is talking about... Uh, that's very interesting here. It says, Pharmacy Management Seminar presented by Ted R. Gladson, president of PE Systems, a consulting firm. So uh, that was interesting to me because they had referred to the company... As like a contractor in the other book like a renovation contractor but here it says consultant firm and uh here we have um ted gladson went to another pharmacy convention uh i think this one was in the south discussed a study which showed that patients who discuss their medicine with the pharmacist have a greater chance of taking the medicine properly Discussing prescriptions could avoid serious drug interactions, Gladson said, especially if the patient is receiving medicine from more than one physician. So this shows that he's kind of in politics in a way. Uh, he's kind of advocating for a bigger role for pharmacists in the medical uh, community, which is something I think uh, that is interesting to say the least. Uh, what... Does it mean? Uh, it kind of reminds me of this, like um, these these pharmacy the pharmacy company reps and stuff were going out and talking to doctors about prescribing more of the medicine. It, it's kind of got a vibe like that. And um, like I said, this guy gave remodeling jobs to Gacy. Uh, he's involved in kind of the politics of healthcare in a sense. And they said twenty or thirty jobs. It's a lot of jobs. And uh, I don't know how much he's getting per pharmacy. He's stealing pills from the pharmacies, possibly. There's evidence he has a lot of pills. So the fact that this guy was employing Gacy to do contracting um, when when Gacy was like, uh, you know, that that part of it is like everyone wants to be like, oh, Gacy was so unhinged. Gacy was so um, creepy. He was a wannabe. He was a loser. Nobody trusted him, right? That all these people associated with him. But in a way, he was put in positions of trust. And the fact that his behavior was so erratic, I think when you see the these tapes of Gacy, uh, either audio tapes or um, later on, they've got uh, uh, this Netflix series, the Defense Diaries, we're going to talk about a little later on. They were. Um, taping him and he's just when he's talking it just is uh he's on hinge you know he's just he's just ranting in a way that's like stream of consciousness and like it's like he's he's kind of you know feeling he's kind of it's, whatever he's saying is it's like when joe biden talks right like he's just feeling you out to see what you're what's going to impress you or like overwhelm you or, or bluff you you know and then if you actually look at what he's saying written down it really makes no sense uh, and that's my overall impression of gacy but ted gladson hired gacy i went through a lot of these newspaper.com results for ted gladson uh there were multiple ted gladsons but it seemed that 
the Ted Gladson. There's a Ted Gladson, the father. Teddy Gladson is the one who worked at P who owned P and E and employed Gacy. So I felt that I kind of sifted through this, and I, that most of these results are the actual Ted Gladson. Basically, to be journalistically ethical, I got to interview him, call him up, confirm the facts. Uh, I'm gonna think about doing that, whether or not that's appropriate in this context. Yeah. But anyway, uh, we're going to press with uh, what we got, I guess. So one of the things about Ted Gladson is his family would like publish in the newspaper when they were going to someone's house for dinner. So right here it says, Bill Toner, 617 Oriole, celebrated his ninth birthday Saturday. Dinner guests were his grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Gladson, and Mr. and Mrs. Henry Hagulauer, all of Chicago. And then it says here, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Gladson and son Teddy of Chicago. Spent from Monday to th until Thursday here in the home of his brothers and their families. So, and then right here it says, Guests at V and Tony Toners were V's brother and family, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Devinger, and son Gary of Mount Pleasant, Iowa, and Mr. and Mrs. Ted Gladson of Chicago. And then this is a result that describes the golf game. Uh, Harry Green won the 27-hole third flight with 162. Jim Rose, Terry Stith, and Ted Gladson tied for second with 184 totals. So what does that tell you? Uh, like he's getting these articles written about his social life and sports games. It seems like this guy's pretty rich and kind of grew up rich and is affiliated with social circles where they, they, they're, um, you know, kind of publishing. I mean, this is a thing rich people do, you know, I'm, I'm a, a son of some privilege. I'm going to own up to that. Uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about my personal life too much. Uh, I don't think my parents were at this level where they got like, they went to dinner and they got in the newspaper. Uh, I think they kind of wanted to be there basically more like my grandparents wanted to be there, but weren't. anyway, I'm not going to get in my personal life. Don't feel sad for me. V Tony, we're talking about program to kill and stuff. It's operational security. I can't talk too much about my personal life. I wish I could V toner's brother, Ted Gladson of Chicago. Arrived here after spending a week in Las Vegas, Nevada, to spend the day with V and the boys at 617 Oriole Lane. So they're getting repeatedly written up. All they did was come to dinner. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't put this one in here, but there was one that was pretty funny. It was like, uh, Ted Gladson spent the weekend at his mother's bedside uh, in blah, 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 town, blah, blah, blah. So it's like, put in the newspaper. It's like, was he at the bedside the whole time? Was a reporter there? Did they see it? But it's like, Kind of sentimental. It's, it's a thing that rich white people do. I'm going to call them what they are. They're wasps, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants. I guess they could be Catholic. But they do this kind of thing. So, and it says right here, Lyle, 1973 Ohio Street, La Salle National Trust trustee to Ted Gladson, November 8th, $1.25 million. So, Lyle was put in the newspaper as the location of... uh. P &E systems uh i think i don't remember the date on this one i think it was in the 70s or so but it seems like teddy gladson now he's going by ted gladson he got some money from his family 1.25 million and if you remember a minute ago we we're talking about nine thousand dollars a year was a lot of money and so getting 1.25 million from a trust that shows you're pretty rich you're at the high hot bourgeoisie so this guy was associating with john bait Gacy, yeah, he was just hiring him. He was hiring him according to the newspaper to do contracts, construction contracts. So you could imagine a rich guy, he's if he hires a construction contractor, then you know that guy's not gonna he didn't like meet that guy from the country club or whatever. You know, there's some social mobility, but it it when you put it all together that this guy who's very rich uh is hiring Gacy. And where did he meet Gacy? Uh, the, you know, through these parties that he was famous for throwing at his house, uh, through the Democratic Party. It, it seems that Gacy has some financial juice as well. So, uh, here we go. This is, oh, I put this as smart. I put the dates on these. So, Mrs. Ted Gladson and son Teddy and Mrs. J.R. North and twin sons Barry and Larry are here from Chicago visiting Mrs. Edward Divinger. Mrs. Gladson is Eddie Devinger's mother, and Mrs. North is his sister. 
1945, 1948, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Gladson and son Teddy of Chicago spent from Monday until Thursday here in the home of his brothers and their families. B and Tony Toner, six good old 617 Oriole Lane, celebrated Mother's Day by entertaining V's mother and her husband, Mr. and Mrs. Ted Gladson, Chicago, Mr. and Mrs. Teddy Gladson, Day Plains. So Teddy Gladson was living in Day Plains, Des Plains, 1961. And getting written up in the newspaper, going to dinner. So uh, this would have been uh, when Gacy was a teenager or whatever. But it's the same northwest side of Chicago that Gacy's eventually going to settle down in. And I'm pretty sure this is the same Ted Gadsden. And Ted Gladson. And there weren't that many. So here we go. This Ted Gladson does not acknowledge p and &E systems on his personal website. Somewhat understandable. You know, why would you want to advertise your association to John Wayne Gacy? But um, he says that he's a retail expert. Says he's a pharmacist and entrepreneur. His business experience spans decades with a special interest in store design and merchandising. The creator of the first visual merchandising tool known as the Planogram. Ted Gladson revolutionized product placement in stores and improved the restocking process. So he says his company is called Gladson Interactive. Uh, I'm pretty sure this is the same Ted Gladson. Uh, I could do some more cross-referencing. Obviously, journalistically, I'm supposed to ask him, are you the same Ted Gladson who owned Peony Systems? So I'm not trying to dox some random person with the same name as this other guy. But it's it seems like there weren't that many Ted Gladsons in the paper to begin with. And this guy's a pharmacist and he was at the pharmacy convention associated to P&E systems consulting firm. So I'm pretty sure this is the same Ted Gladson. He invented this thing called the planogram, which you should Google if you're audio only. It's pretty interesting invention. It's like, it's like a visual theme schematic of what the shelf is supposed to look like. And it's kind of like, it kind of reminds me of like these, uh, these war planning tools. Like when they, uh, if you watch the, um, Century of the Self guy, uh, oh God, what was his name? The guy who did Century of the Self and hypernormalized Adam Curtis. So Adam Curtis showed, I think some, like they created like 3D CGI mock-ups of all the battles in the first Gulf War. So that the generals could like go through them and like see where each bullet was fired and stuff. It kind of is on that vibe, but for like the commerce, it's very interesting how business is often organized according to the uh, organizational plan of military units and stuff. And even this is this kind of a battle plan for the shelf, your war on the consumer's mind. And it's it's kind of in that vibe of like hypnotizing the consumer with a brightly colored shelf so it's like literally each thing is if you're looking at the slideshow you see it's a bunch of beer bottles and each beer bottle has its own position on the shelf and they're sort of i think the idea is that you're they're supposed to be like complementary and uh oh yeah here it is yeah one of ted gladson's pivotal creations has been picture planograms which he debuted by redesigning a Chicago drugstore's cold slash cough se section to include the cough syrup, Robitussin, which was stocked behind the counter and not currently displayed on self-service. The results were immediate. Within two years afterward, nationwide implementation catapulted Robitussin to the number one selling cough syrup within two years. So this is pretty interesting to me. I think uh, this guy's... Um, business acumen that this is the same guy who hired john wayne gacy i'm like 99 sure like i said i gotta ask him to be 100 percent sure uh but i'm not really like exactly a journalist you know and i don't know if i necessarily want to reach out so i'm just thinking i'm gonna think about that if you are angry at me mr gladson you can reach out to me and you know i'll edit you out of this if you don't want to be in this i'll edit you out but you know doesn't matter you know just complain and and i'll back down you know i'm i'm a big big coward not trying to get in a pissing contest with the really rich guy from the midwest 
So this guy is a philanthropist as well. He supports the Wounded Warrior Project's independence program. So he's kind of got his own. It kind of it was it was kind of hard to find information about this. I was also researching Ted at the last minute. Uh, for some reason, the image that goes with uh, the Wounded Warrior Project's independence program is a bunch of people in Brazilian army uniforms. Does, does the Wounded Warrior Project work with soldiers from Brazil? They got a Brazilian flag on their arm patch in his Medium article that he wrote. They said he, okay, Ted Gladson spent nearly 35 years as the president of Gladson Interactive in Lyle, Illinois. So that's, come on, that's got to be P&E Systems. It said Lyle, Illinois. Yeah, I strongly am influenced by this information to believe this is the same. But, like I said, it's basically allegedly because I'm not slandering anyone. I'm in, I'm, this is a website he wrote. He wrote Lyle, Illinois. The other newspaper article wrote Lyle, Illinois. Had to clear my throat there. Since retiring in 2005, he has focused his efforts on supporting philanthropic organizations such as the Wounded Warrior Project. So that's kind of sketch. There's a lot of scandals involving the, the Wounded Warrior Project. Um, a lot of veterans criticized it for uh, maybe taking a heavy-handed approach to uh, the veterans' lives. And, you know, I'm not going to get into too much criticism of Ted Gladson anyway. But one thing I can tell you is that uh, P&E Systems is not in the porno field, okay? Uh, I don't know if this is the same P&E Systems. This is a business opportunities ad that was published in the newspaper. I should have written the date on this one. It would have been interesting. Maybe we'll follow up on this in part two. But this is what the ad says. 730 business opportunities. Uh, Aluminum, lawn service business, those are the first two opportunities. Business opportunity for young, ambitious man or woman whose avocation is making movies. No monetary investment required, but must have thorough knowledge of latest filmmaking techniques, film and equipment. Part-time and beginning, evenings and weekends, but with goal of full-time profession. This is not in the porno field. Please write complete technical and personal resume to P&E Systems, Inc. P.O. Box 206, Bonita Springs, Florida, 33923. You will be contacted. So, you know, is this the same P&E Systems? There weren't that many results for P&E Systems on newspapers.com. I went through most of them on the first run. Uh, I do need to kind of go through them again and confirm um, if I've, like, exhausted all the P&E Systems. It's a pretty big coincidence that this is a different P&E Systems. It's unclear if it's the same P&E systems, why they would be doing film, why they would say that it's not in the porno field. Uh, kind of a weird thing to include in an ad. But it says here in the newspaper, P&E systems is not in the porno field. Well, here we are again. We are at the, the hypercube slide. And this, this slide right here is the one I was trying to show. This is on Wikipedia article for Tesseract, if you want to look it up, audio listeners. So you start with a point at zero dimensions. You extrude it outwards in one direction, and you get a line in between two points. Then that's in one dimension. Two dimensions, okay, you're going to take that line with two points, extrude it outwards, you get another line, an, uh, from one point to a line, you get another line from connecting the dots. It's a very elegant diagram. Describing it is, is kind of like, uh, you know, like a radio presentation of a beautiful painting or whatever. But you get a square by pushing out the line uh, perpendicular to its kind of length. Then you take a square, you extrude it out in three dimensions. And uh, the two squares form a cube. And then there's a fourth perpendicular direction that we cannot see because we see we uh, vibe out in three dimensions. And we don't really have the vibrational receiver for vibing in the fourth dimension exactly. But you, if you extrude this cube out, you get this shape that is like, uh, let's see, it says it has, um, it's like 16 corners. 
right? And then it's got uh, a lot of faces, extra faces. Basically, every combination, most of the combinations of those 16 corners are going to form faces. So let's say there's 12 faces, more faces than the six faces on a cube. Actually, maybe it's more than 12 faces. But you got this hypercube. And if you're rotating the hypercube, and let's, uh, let's vibe out to the, to the hypercube ro rotations for a minute. Uh, you're rotating the hypercube. And you're seeing the small cube expand and shrink as it becomes the exterior of the other cube. And this is like, it seems like it's contradictory information. It seems like it's impossible for the inner cube to become the outer cube smoothly. But it is possible because this thing is just rotating around in the fourth dimension. And you're not aware of that fourth dimension. So, uh... A lot of the facts we talked about so far are counterintuitive. How can the Democratic Party uh, be the bad guys? I guess that's a counterintuitive fact if you're very blue pilled lib, right? The Democratic Party in Chicago behaves like the Republican Party in Texas. I mean, probably it used to be the Democratic Party that was the bossing the South around anyway. And what is this guy Gacy doing there? Like, what, what, what is he doing there? Why is he a precinct captain? Why does he have a position of responsibility? Why is this rich guy giving him 20 or 30 remodeling jobs? Is it just because he's such a self-effacing man who's willing to stoop and bow that they, uh, they just ignore him and he goes and gets away with what he does in the shadows? Is that what's going on? You know, I think there's, there's more to the to the there's more to the shape of what's going on. And it's not like you can't look at it linearly from the perspectives that you are used to and see it in a sensible way. You've got to just grok the vibes for a while. And this is kind of how you get in a program to kill, maybe this idea of that the CIA programmed all the serial killers well it doesn't exactly seem like that you know is it that like you've got one cia agent following the serial killer around you know you know oh he starts being nice so you got to run up behind him hypnotize him again make him mean you know is that exactly how it is uh no it's not like that it's it's like there's a way in which this interaction maybe is is uh occurring along a vector with which we're in unfamiliar. In fact, definitionally almost it is. So um, let's go back. Let's go back to the slideshow. Okay. We're getting somewhere. All right. Talking a lot of uh, uh shit right here. So let's get let's get off this business trip. Just getting too far into the fourth dimension. I don't want to slander someone who has a lot of money and is still alive. So maybe next episode we'll do that after doing a lot more research. Maybe not. We won't be slandering no matter what. All right, let's talk about some more of Gacy's Chicago Juice. So again, uh, this is kind of why I praise this book. They got a lot of the, the episodes which are editorialized in the prosecutor's book, Terry Sullivan and, and Amirante's book. Uh, Gacy introduced him. So this is an excerpt from the, the man who killed boys. Gacy introduced himself as a Democratic precinct captain when he approached loop attorney James E. Noland with a young man who had been given a traffic ticket. Gacy explained that he often did favors for constituents and during a subsequent two year period, he referred about 40 people. Several times, young men referred to Nolan by Gacy appeared for one or more court hearings and then failed to show up at others. Gacy himself was arrested for speeding. Nolan helped him obtain an acquittal. So this is uh, cool that he went in the archives and found the court hearings and, and found the traces of these uh, parapolitical events. Fixing a ticket, that's a parapolitical event. It's not acknowledged that you can just go find an attorney and they'll fix your ticket for you. Okay, 
Ticket fixing is also big business. This podcast was just pretty pretty interesting. I think maybe this the main character was uh just a little bit more to the story than they let on to kind of valorize this guy maybe a little too much. But Deep Cover Mobland was about a guy who was not just a ticket fixer, he was a, a fixer for much bigger crimes and was was fixing trials on a much larger scale in Chicago in the must have been the 70s, 80s, around the same time. And in 88, as part of Operation Greylord, I didn't have a chance to fact check this, but I think that Operation Greylord is the operation that this guy from the Deep Cover podcast was uh, snitching in, possibly. But there's like a lot of operations like this in Chicago where they kind of like clean up the bottom layer of the the corruption uh, flow chart. They kind of sweep them up and then, you know, in another six years, they do the same thing again. But this one was called Operation Greylord and uh, it involved Noland, James E. Noland, loop attorney. And uh, I'm pretty sure it's the same James E. Noland. He was fixing DUI tickets. Uh, so two lawyers who paid bribes sentenced. Two former lawyers who admitted paying bribes. Cook County Circuit Court Judge John H. McCollum to fix drunken driving cases in traffic court were sentenced Monday to prison terms of more than a year. James E. Noland, 55 of 665 West Sheridan Road, sentenced by U.S. District Court Judge, 15 months in prison, $15,000 fine, 400 hours community service. William Riley was the other one. Uh, admitted, so then McCollum pleaded guilty. It's awaiting sentencing. That's funny. I wonder if they're going to give him a slap on the wrist because he's a judge. He admitted accepting dozens of bribes in, escape, in exchange of giving favorable results to defendants accused of drunken driving. So again, this is an indicative of having juice. Uh, Nolan and Riley had pleaded guilty. Oh, wait, what's his racketeering stuff? Nolan and Riley had pleaded guilty March 29 to one count each of racketeering, making a false statement of the Internal Revenue Service. The charges stem from their failure to report fee income paid in cash on their income taxes. The charges against Noel and Riley and McCollum resulted from the Operation Greylord investigation of corruption in the Cook County courts. 64 individuals have been charged. So, what does this mean about Gacy? Does this mean that he was a hanger on, a wannabe, lurking in the shadows? He heard about this, uh, this fixer judge and then he really just pushed his leverage all the way, pushed his advantage as far as he could as a unilateral loner creeper to go in and uh, exploit this this bribe guy uh to self-aggrandize you know did the people who were the people whose tickets he fixed influential you'd be interested to dig into what is the web around these attorneys you know what's the web around this judge but basically it says here that I had to clear my throat real quick. Okay. It says here that he referred 40 people. Okay. So it's a lot of people. Uh, 40. It's a big number for people. Uh, they, three's com no, two's company, three's crowd, right? 40, crowd. And uh, if, they keep, if he keeps funneling these people from his ward in to get their tickets fixed, uh, one, that's probably going to get the attention of the precinct. I mean, the, uh, the ward committeemen. Right. And two, maybe it's like he said his constituent, he's doing favors for his constituents. Maybe that's helping him bring out the vote and stuff. So is this, the, you know, so it's like there's a, like an anti, uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's like this guy is, is got some clout, you know, and then this, this, this lawyer got busted in 88, which is going to be, uh, DC was busted in 79. This guy was, this lawyer was busted in this other operation that was basically Operation Greylord. I think it was like a liberal reform, do-gooder thing. Uh, and it didn't come. It's not like, so this guy was had some protection as well. So, you know, this guy's, Gacy's integrated into many webs. So, yes. Oh, yeah. June 23rd, 87, Chicago Tribune. That's where this was published. 
And uh, speaking of attorneys, okay, uh, for the audio only listener, I have a collage here of Gacy's defense attorney. His tweets are uh, collaged here, uh, kind of illustrating his persona. He is a conservative shithead on Twitter now. And he was a precinct captain with Gacy. He says in his book that Gacy was also a precinct captain. Gacy turned out more votes than him. He became Gacy's a defense attorney. Then uh, after Gacy was given the death penalty, after the attempted insanity defense, he ran for Illinois State Senate and won. Uh, I think he won the first time he ran. Uh, like I said, I, I did to put this all together. I kind of went in, like overboard with the research and it's hard to fit it all together. And also, um, I realized I want to get this episode out. So we're getting this episode out and there's potentially going to be a follow up, but I wanted to start off season two, you know, I want to get, get o OAS info back on, on the air, but let's read some of these tweets. It says, thank you for signing our petition. July 28th, 2020, this would be during the uprising associated with George Floyd, to stop defunding.com. So it's probably stop, you know, it's related to defunding the police, and I think it's not in support. Look who's number one bestseller in legal history. Hyphen, that's right, hyphen. John Wayne Gacy, hyphen, defending a monster, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. So uh, celebrating himself and his book. Retweeted Laura Ingram. This period is period courage period this and that is a quote tweet of Dinesh D'Souza and it's a whole girls soccer team kneeling to uh, in kind of Colin Kaepernick style protest one girl is oh, I guess I don't know what gender they are but uh, seems like they're probably conservative and identify as a girl they're standing and holding their hand over their heart pledging allegiance during the uh, uh, I don't know, national anthem, I guess, which they sing at soccer games now. So then uh, she said, I am not a worm. I will not kneel. I will not fly the swastika flag. That's what they had to say about uh, worshiping the American flag. Staying on the feet while your teammates are kneeling. Since no one appears, seems to remember D-Day, uh, listen to the tribute to fallen heroes sung by remember that's a collage so part of us cut off bestseller in law so this is a different tweet about his book being bestseller Cuban community rallies behind Nulu restaurant after controversy over BLM demands so WFPL kind of looks like it could be the Midwest or maybe even the South or Missouri or something uh, this is kind of my favorite one I made it the episode art Sam Amirante he has a notes app screenshot it says scores of Italians in this country have been unjustly stereotyped, beaten and killed by the police and others. But we didn't riot. We didn't destroy the country. Instead, we built the country with brick, mortar, hard work, education and inclusiveness to earn respect from those who were and some still are prejudiced against us. The horrible, unthinkable killing of George Floyd is sadly being used as an excuse for domestic terrorists to wage a war on our country. So uh yeah guess you know he's wants to stand up for italians uh very proud of his heritage and uh not at all sympathetic to uh the uprising calling them terrorists i think there are a few italians accused of terrorism such as your sacco and venzanti and uh Yeah, just being, he's retweeting the police all the time. He retweeted Paul Vias, who's a conservative shit out on Twitter. It's a picture of somebody like, like jump. Oh, is it, it's not clear if the person's jumping on the hood of a cop car or if a cop car hit them, causing them to fall onto the hood. Uh, yeah. Anyway, this, this, uh, Italian American nationalism. Pretty cringe. So he had defended Gacy during the murder trial. Prior to the arrest of Gacy, Gacy sought him out as a fellow Robert Martwick Norwood Park Township precinct captain and asked him to 
intervene with the De Plains police who had been starting, started following Gacy around sort of uh, close follow tactics, visibly following him. Not, you know, he, Gacy famously drove very erratically. And so he would do things like pull a U-turn in a busy street, start driving the other way. And they wouldn't try to hide. They would just follow him because I guess their side of the story is that they basically suspected he was murdering these children and they needed to follow him all the time. And uh, I haven't gone too much into the investigation for the listeners. I kind of viewed this as there is a lot of material out there telling Gacy's story from start to finish. So I felt I was going to focus kind of on my niche of what is his political uh, how much clout does he have in the Chicago machine? That was kind of a question I wanted to answer. And I kind of left aside some of um, the investigation, the murders themselves. I haven't talked about. Uh, I'm going to talk about his early life a little bit to, to kind of tease the next episode. But I'm mostly researched the clout. But yeah, he was getting followed around by the cops and he started doing weird stuff like he would buy them a beer. Like he would, he'd know they were following him. He'd go into the bar. Famously, he went into the Moose Lodge at Des Plaines, which is like a Elks or like a kind of, I guess, it's, I mean, it's pretty much like the Freemasons or the Shriners or whatever. It's like a fraternal order. And he went into their bar. The cops followed him in and then he sent them beer. And then the cops said in the, John Gacy Netflix series tapes that they sent him a beer back. So why are these cops drinking beer on duty? Isn't that uh, also they are part of a weird thing called um, the Delta Unit, which is uh, kind of a mod squad. Very interesting. Sam Iran, Sam Mirante, Slam Mirante. Uh, yeah, he he got involved in legislation we're going to get into in a minute later after he defended gacy but this is what he looked like back in the um the days when he was defending gacy it's a black and white photo he's got his necktie kind of loose the top button's undone you know kind of frank sinatra at the end of the night he's got curly hair uh you might call it jufro uh he's italian kind of looks like pugnacious um I'm feeling a bit of a, you know, uh, what's that guy's name? John, John Belushi kind of vibe. Hey, you know, uh, anyway, so anti-Italian. I mean, I, I'm pro-Italian, but maybe that was prejudiced in some respects. Uh, yeah, anyway, Gacy was a political wannabe, one of those guys that was always around talking about all the big shots he knew, hoping that the importance of others would rub off on him, a nice enough guy, maybe a little pushy, a bit of a blowhard, telling tell tales, but still a nice enough guy. So that's what he said about Gacy to preface his comments. He was a precinct captain for the Norwood Park Township Regular Democratic Organization, and so was I. He was actually one of the best precinct captains they ever had, better than me, some might tell you he really brought in the votes for that tiny organization so you just said he's a wannabe and then right in the next breath you're saying he's the best precinct captain in your ward i tried to figure out how many wards there were in the 1970s how many precinct captains did robert martwick have uh oh the other thing is are did gacy have assistant precinct captains uh yeah let me let me read the next quote and then we'll do a little reflect I had met him at one function or the other. He always bought a full table at all the fundraisers, 10 tickets, which translated into a sizable contribution to the party. And then he'd fill the 10 seats with kids that looked like they really didn't wear business suits very often. Unsophisticated. That, that, that. That would be a kind way to put it. They were usually his employees, young kids that worked for his contracting business. So I don't think he had assistant captains. I think he basically used his employees for this purpose, which would have put him in kind of the transitional, uh, position to the future neoliberal future of the highly privatized democratic party i mean highly privatized city government with a sort of a neoliberal neo-democratic machine not with the patronage jobs but uh with kind of like private sector uh 
relationships. So Amirante is saying kind of the tale you hear about Gacy. Yeah, he uh, associated with so many people, but because he was a loser and nobody liked him, but um, he's giving money to the party. I think he's getting money out of the party with this at least one contract for construction in, in Norwood Park Township. He's getting the vote out for sure. Uh, and, and he's got influence as a local employer. So like if this guy is obnoxious, if he's rambling and weird, that, that does not inconsistent with him having clout. In fact, you kind of find that with the people with the, you know, the, the back slappers or whatever, they talk to you. It doesn't make sense what they're saying. And then it rebounds to their advantage. Cause you're trying to figure out what they're talking about. Cause you want them to do something for you. And you know, they, they kind of like get that Nero shit going on where they're, you know, they have some power, but then they're, fantasies are roaming even further abroad you know like i've mentioned that joe biden's really weird i think all these presidents are pretty weird in person have a uh let's call him a family friend that's kind of like got some juice in politics and uh they're always like there's no idea what they're talking about but it's like it's always in kind of a tone where it's like oh you got you should be interested in this you don't know what i'm talking about maybe there's something wrong with you you know anyway Enough. I like I said, I try to keep my personal life out of that. Plus, he was on the Norwood Park Township Street Lighting District as a trustee, the secretary treasurer, and I did some volunteer work on the side of the district. I was their lawyer, so I knew him. So he got thirty five hundred bucks out of that position, uh, and it left an impression on Amirante, unless he was just sort of like you know covering everything that came out in the papers to kind of get it out of the way. Uh, yeah, here we go. Bob uh, Mata Jr. I like this podcast. Uh, they did some cool investigation. So, um, yeah, there's some gaps right here in the recording. Uh, cause I'm coughing and stuff. I don't want to put you through that. Uh, hopefully we could get Bob Mata Jr. on. Talk a little bit about what he discovered. He's going to explain it better than me. But he got a number of um, aligning pieces of information, self, you know, consistent, corroborate, I don't know what you call it, legal terms, corroborating. It's like a bunch of data points that are reinforcing one another. He looked through the property sheets. Okay, the, the in the Gacy investigation, there's a key piece of evidence. There's a photo receipt, which is kind of, it's like a movie ticket. You tear it off and there's a ticket stub for the photo envelope. There was a, the, the murder that he was originally investigated for was for a man named Robert Peace who disappeared from a pharmacy, Nissan Pharmacy. And uh, his family told the police that he was talking to John Gacy right before he disappeared. And I guess they this was not enough for them to investigate Gacy in a meaningful way. But uh, for some reason, they decided to investigate Gacy. They searched his house multiple times and they found um, porn and, and uh, the exotic uh downers and uppers like i said preludin some i never heard of it's like an amphetamine adderall it's amphetamine but uh they use a ring it's like a ring instead of the the nitrate nitrogen amine group i know a little about chemistry but it's, it's like it was kind of weird i was like damn what the fuck why is he taking this weird medicine how does he know about it so he uh he was at the pharmacy uh, they searched his house, but critically, what Bob Ma Jr. found was that they said they found this photo receipt that the uh, cashier and co-worker of Rob Peace said that they had put this photo receipt in Rob Peace's pocket. And uh, then they said they found the photo receipt inside Gacy's house, so they knew that Rob Peace was in the house because the photo receipt was uh, in the trash in the house. And this was the motivation for the second search warrant. And Sam Amirante was preparing a lawsuit against the Displaced Police uh, at this time. So they kind of had to get their T's crossed. Basically, Bob Mata Jr., he interviewed, oh yeah, they said they found the photo receipt and they said they smelled the smell of a cadaver, of a dead body in the house when they were looking, poking around. So uh, Bob Mata Jr., Got out all of the uh, evidence logs and found that the photo receipt was not 
uh, entered into evidence at the proper time or in the proper place. It was entered into evidence in a very suspicious way that suggested that it had been added after the fact even of the search. He interviewed a cop who said that, no, they didn't find the photo receipt in the house. They found it in the exterior garbage when they were surveilling Gacy. They asked the garbage man to give him the garbage, and they found the photo receipt there. This is what the cop said. Uh, Bob Mata Jr., I felt he implied in his podcast, and I got to ask him about this. I like to have him on. I Twitter message him again after this goes out. Maybe he can listen to us, see what he thinks. Uh, see if it's worth coming on. But basically, it, it this guy, it sounded like this cop was also lying that possibly the photo receipt was totally planted because even though this cop changed the story and said they found it outside, uh, the photo receipt was like dry and clean. It didn't look like it had been in the garbage. And according to the evidence logs, it had been out of the proper chain of custody. It wouldn't have been valid in court anyway, even if they would have found it outside. And there's pretty strong in, in evidence that it was planted. He interviewed an evidence tech who did the actual um, uh, uh, exhumation of the remains under the house. And the evidence tech said the house just smelled mildewy, damp, like many houses in this area where there was a very clay heavy soil brought in to fill the area in. But then it, uh, it was uh, somehow the water got in and really made it gross. So, but it wasn't like, it didn't smell like death in the house. It wasn't obvious. That's what the evidence tech is. So he kind of put all these, this confluence of circumstances together that um, strongly suggested that this photo receipt was not uh, in the, is not like legit, that, that it was possibly totally manufactured, not even in the exterior garbage. And in... Sam Amirante's book, which I read uh, the, the first few chapters of. I, I like to read the rest of it because it, it's, he name drops all these people who Gacy knew that hadn't found another book. So it's like, I got to do like exegesis of it. Like you're reading uh, James Joyce Finnegan's Wake or whatever. Got to go through all the names and look up who they are and what are their backgrounds. But basically he goes in this extended anecdote of what happened the night Rob Peast was murdered. And, uh, you know, okay, so content warning, first of all, if, if you are sensitive to hearing about violence or, uh, I am not going to go into any graphic details of a sexual assault, but, uh, it's possible it could trigger that kind of thing, just how I'm discussing it. Uh, I'm going to try to moderate my language compared to what Sam Amirante was saying. But the first thing is that, so Sam Almirante describes Gacy, what exactly he said to Robert Peast when he got him in the van, what exactly he said when he brought him back to the house. And he, after Gacy murders uh, uh, Robert Peast in Sam Almirante's telling, he says that Gacy specifically thought about the jacket with the photo receipt in the pocket and like, he says, uh, uh, you know, my setup is very delicate recording with the screen share, so I'm not gonna, um, I'm not going to mess it up, mess with it, and possibly crash my whole stream. But in the book, I forgot to separate this quote, apparently at the last minute, but in the book, he's like, and then I looked at the photo receipt and I said to myself, nobody's picking up those photos. So why did Sam Amirante include this graphic detail about what Gacy was thinking about the photo receipt when the photo receipt was like very suspicious evidence and he should have gone and uh, figured that out in the first place? Because Bob Mata Sr., we're going to play a clip of Bob Mata Sr. in a minute. Uh, he came after this, basically all the bodies were found and stuff. So it was kind of hard to go back and argue about, I mean, I don't know. Uh, he didn't know that the search warrant was baseless, and it seems like attacking it would have been a pretty tall order when you just found all these bones in the basement already. But Sam Amirante, uh, he sh you know, wh why didn't he, uh, why is he writing his book and including that, oh, and then Gacy looked at the photo receipt and said to himself, hey, nobody's going to be picking up these photos. Like, why did he include that? So he includes that shit, and then uh, 
on top of that, um, he is describing how Gacy uh, sort of began his uh, uh, predatory uh, rhetoric as he's gearing up to uh, uh, rape and murder Robert Peast, you know, and he says that that Gacy said, um, oh, you know, uh, it, it feels the same. You know, it doesn't matter if a guy is sucking your dick or a girl is sucking your dick. You know, it feels the same with your eyes closed. So he says that Gacy said that to Robert Peace, and Robert Peace is dead. And Gacy, uh, I watched the Netflix series where they did the tapes. I listened to this defense diary where Gacy's talking on tape. Gacy can't stay on the same subject for more than 10 seconds. Like, that is not typical of how Gacy interacted with people. Uh, there, there were people uh, in content, you know, steal yourself for descriptions of Gacy's remarks. One of the things Gacy said on tape in the uh, uh, in the Netflix series was he started saying stuff like, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to commit a sex act on you if you win the pool game. And then if I win the pool game, you're going to commit a sex act on me. So Gacy was was very, very um, talked like in this weird legalist way where he's describing having sex in the, like the language of the statute against homosexual activity. Because he was obsessed with cops, he was very homophobic, and I don't think he's going to be spinning these tales about, oh, you know, it uh, feels the same for guys sucking your dick compared to a girl. And then also Sam Amirante includes this anecdote again. He says that one of Gacy's friends, who supposedly Gacy had one of his first uh, homosexual experiences with, that this guy used the exact same line the proposition Gacy he said, Oh, and then Gacy's friend said to Gacy, uh, Oh, you know, uh, if a guy's sucking your dick, I don't see any difference between a guy sucking your dick versus a girl sucking your dick. And uh, it's all the same to me with my eyes closed. So, uh, Sam Amirante recycles this anecdote twice. My perception is it seems unlikely that Gacy would have related this anecdote because Gacy was so erratic and it just doesn't reflect Gacy's vibe, which is of this, uh, uh, cruel and uh, it, it, Gacy's got this cop vibe, this cop wannabe vibe, and uh, it seems like this line came from Sam Amirante, and I don't know why he uses it twice in his book. I don't think that obviously he wasn't in a position to know what Gacy really said before he murdered Rob Peast, and I don't think Gacy told him this line, so I don't know what's going on. Sam Amirante talking about, you know. I mean, it seems like it's not with Gacy's whole, like, sadistic cop, you know, the law, the, the, we're breaking the law now, you're my, you know, it's not with that Gacy vibe. It's pretty chill, I guess, like, you know, I mean, if you're talking about, you know, kind of working up to, uh, doing something gay with your boys, being like, hey, man, you know, not that different, guys like your dick, girls like your dick, what's the difference? I mean, that's, like, kind of chill line i would say for that kind of scenario and uh yeah i don't know why sam Amarante is attributing to gacy i think he should just you know uh kind of take authorship over that line which my perception is he is the author of that line and it's chill i don't be ashamed of so Amirante, in addition to embellishing his book he also let the cops interrogate gacy alone and then he let gacy confess to the cops with him present so gacy amirante was present for gacy's confession to the police where he drew the notorious diagram of where the bodies were buried which amirante includes in his book and is in all the many true crime stories gacy's diagram uh and he was hired by Gacy, retained by Gacy, in his own words, paid $3,000 by Gacy during the surveillance period of the investigation to investigate what was the cause of the surveillance. And that means that Gacy had an attorney when he confessed uh, and when he was getting interrogated alone, which seems like uh, kind of like uh, you're never going to, I think Amirante says something about, I never second guess a lawyer because I don't know what the circumstances were. Uh, I 
you whenever you talk i'm not a lawyer so i can second guess anyone you know whenever you talk to a lawyer they never want to second guess another lawyer they never want to say oh this guy fucked up you know but my perception is if your client hires you yeah he, uh and and then he gets arrested you're supposed to be there and not let him talk to them uh and and especially not let him confess and so now we're going to listen to Bob Mata Sr. interview John Wayne Gacy about what he said when he confessed. Gacy says he doesn't remember saying anything. And Bob Mata Sr. is getting increasingly frustrated with Gacy over his uh, inability to communicate. A failure to communicate, to quote the uh, cool hand loop. But let's just listen to this clip and then we'll do some reflecting on it. Okay, oops. Okay. All right. There we go. Here's a clip. Do you recall burying anybody down there? No. I don't recall. Do you recall anything at all about a body being down there? For what reason? I don't know, but when we read some of these statements, I, you remember, you, t you, you draw a map for them, you show them where the bodies are, and then you tell them you can't remember, and I, it just drives me up a wall. I want to know... Well, when I drew the map, again... One of these I things, don't recall. one of these statements... And I'm going <clears> to... <throat> one of the statements... Um, Regarding the map, when you do the map, one of the statements when you drew the map, John, was taken on December 22nd at 5.15 p.m. That's after you were arraigned and after you had been in custody. And at what time in the morning? 5.15 p.m. on December 22nd. That means you had been in custody... 24, 29 hours already, okay, from noon on the 21st up until the time of this statement. Sam Amaranti was not here. Nobody else was there at the time of the statement either. It was after you were arraigned. Oh, this was on a Friday. And it was 29 hours after you'd been in custody. You had no access to drugs or alcohol, and you made the statement to him, and you drew a map. Well, as I told you before, I don't even remember the first three days of being here. Reporting officer then asked Casey if he could explain where the bodies were in the crawl space. He tried to describe it and was having a difficult time in telling us exactly where the bodies were buried and asked if he could draw us a diagram. All right, at any rate, you draw, draw a diagram. Then after that, you tensed up for about 30 seconds. and made reference to Jack, saying that he must have drawn it. Do you remember this statement? No. It was... Um, I don't remember giving him any statements without Sam being present. Yeah, this one was given to Albrecht. Sam was not present. That was 5.15 on December 22nd. This one was the one taken at 22.30 hours, which would be 10.30 on the 21st of December. That's the time you're coming back from the hospital. All right, you're coming back to the hospital. They get you in the room. They talk to you. That hour that they wouldn't let Sam in, this is what you give them. And this statement talks about peace. We'll read them all later. Uh, you've got to tell me, and I'm going to ask you this. I mean, you've got to tell me if you remember. I want to, okay, I'm going to, I've got to tell you, John, if you, if you pick up vibes from me, you know, if you think that I'm um, leading you or the defense, if you think you've picked out my theory of this defense and you're trying to help it by withholding information from me or any other way, it's going to damage you. 
I mean, you've got to be totally first, honest. First of all, you've you got to be. It's the most important right. thing. Bob, you know, you, if you would slow down and listen once in a while when I say something, you'd understand. I'm, I'm telling you, the way I don't recall, I don't even recall the goddamn statement that I gave. Remember, Sam said there was an there was an hour missing. I said I don't recall if I talked to anybody that hour. Then I had told you that I recalled that there was somebody in the room with me, but I don't remember what I said. It's not that I don't want to remember. I want to give you as much information as possible, but you guys don't seem to understand. I don't remember. I don't remember. I understand what you're saying, and I understand what you're saying that you don't remember, but I'm going to keep asking you the same question over and over and over again. I've got to do it. What i got to tell you is the same guy. You want me to find something out? You don't remember? I'm going to keep asking you. You're going to get pissed off at me? That's the only way I'm going to be able to find out what's on your mind. I don't care if you get pissed off at me. I'm just trying to tell you that you don't seem to understand at the time at the time I went to the hospital, I must have had 130 milligrams of Valium in my system. Okay. Can I tell you something? I don't, I, everything is hazy. I, you know, I, I can, I know I was walking around. I know I went to the courtroom. I don't recall talking to my sister. I don't recall talking to anybody or giving anybody any statements. I know Sam had told me not to give anybody any statements. I don't see any reason why I did it. If I did it, I don't recall it. I'm trying to tell you that. I'm, I know you've told me that. No, no, the thing of it is, is that... That might explain this one, all right? This is the one at 10.30 on the 21st, all right? It also might explain the one when Sam was there, because it was just a short while after that that you, in essence, repeated the same thing with Sam there. In essence, what they did was set Sam up. You know, they get you, they get all this fucking information out of you already. They knew, all right? They knew, they questioned you without a lawyer there, I don't know... They say in here they gave you your rights. They say you knew all about it. You were loose and no, you talked, okay? Then Sam gets there, okay? Here's the picture. He walks in. They walk out and say, oh, Sam, your guy wants to talk. All right? At that point, they already had your statement. Well, then they were only going to a formality of having of a course. Set in of front course. Of, in front of my lawyer. All right. So maybe we can explain those two away. But the one that bothers me the most is the one at 5.15 on December 22nd, John. I mean, that's 29 hours after you're in custody. And I'm trying to tell you, 29 hours don't mean shit to me because I don't remember being processed into this building. I, I remember coming up, and I, I think I was in a room on that side of the hall <coughs> across from this room here. I'm not even sure if I was in that room. The only reason I was able to pass it in is because that Eddie and Alan were in the back in those orange cages, and they brought them both up here into this room here, and they moved me back into there. I, I, I can remember it vaguely, but I, I don't remember as to why I would move from that room back to that room. Did you know why you were being held? At that time? Yes. Yeah, I think I, I was understand tired. understand what the problem was. No, why I don't, you were I don't being know. I, I, couldn't, I don't understand how the hell they, they could hold me for a murder charge when they had no body. Yeah, so there's a couple... Um, interesting uh things there i was tempted to interrupt okay good it's not going to start randomly playing again very good uh one thing is um okay one thing is this 29 hours thing uh the other thing is um he says that so yeah what's this okay there's there's two i'm not gonna beat around the bush it's not worth playing coy about uh, I am going to adopt the lens of Dave McGowan's program to kill thesis for a moment. Uh, and I'll be real with you, this is kind of where I'm coming from. I kind of like, I kind of feel like it's more true than not. But basically his theory is that the um, powers that be, not too precise about who they were, it's a lot of uh, academics military people military intelligence people cia people but they did this mk ultra thing the idea it was successful it wasn't a boondoggle they figured out how to hypnotize people and the way they do it is they induce um dissociative states that are associated to what used to be called the multi -per multi uh multiple personalities that uh, they talk about they want to have a spy who has one personality that's a rabid communist, and they have another personality that's a rabid reactionary. And when you get the spy to come in from the cold to debrief, 
You just hypnotize him, turn on the reactionary guy. He tells you everything the communist guy knows. The communist guy doesn't even know the reactionary personality exists. This is like uh, the ideal Manchurian candidate thing. And basically what Dave McGowan says is that the, uh, the serial killers, they've been programmed uh, to have these nested personalities. And uh, you got to ask, you got to be critical about this. We should criticize this. Uh, my vibe, I'm not going to be real with you. I'm pretty much on board. But I'm not going to just say, oh, Dave McGowan said it, so it's got to be true, you know. Is this stuff about Gacy, I can't remember what happened. He mentions Jack drew the diagram of where the bodies were. Uh, Jack Handley is like uh, an alternative personality Gacy claims to have. And, you know, so this leads to the question of, okay, does is Gacy faking it? Is Gacy erratic and just talking about this stuff but it's not really happening that way it's just like he's just blaming this other person jack and that's just but there's not really a personality that takes over named jack it's just one of the weird things he says when he's you know in his uh reveries of you know this stream of consciousness thing you know uh so one thing is that bob mata senior Take it at face value that he is pissed off that Gacy confessed. Why did you confess uh, already? And now you're saying you don't remember confessing. This is making it much more difficult to handle this uh, insanity defense that they decided to go with. And he's saying, like, look, if you're getting from me that I'm trying to hint to you to fake that you don't remember, I'm not. And he says that to Gacy because he's frustrated with Gacy. So what's going on with Gacy? I'm not going to say I know that Gacy's not faking. I know Gacy has a real personality that was put into him by uh, the CIA or whatever. You know, I don't know that's the case. I don't really know what's going on. But there's a couple things. Gacy supposedly backed out for 29 hours while he was getting interrogated. And Bob Mata Sr. is challenging him like, okay, you would have sobered up from Valium or whatever you were on over the course of 29 hours. So how do you not remember? And then uh, Gacy says he doesn't remember being questioned without his attorney. And uh, then Bob Mata Sr. points out that it says in these notes or whatever, I don't know if he has a notes or a recording or what, but it says that the evidence is that you confess to these murders without your attorney present. And then they quote unquote set up Sam Amirante to come back and then be present for a second confession. Uh, and again, you know, I'm also not going to beat around the bush. I'm not slandering anyone, but it seems that, uh, if Sam Amirante, uh, were like, I mean, okay. What if Gacy is part of a bigger network of business people, politicians, uh, the sociologists call them violence workers. You could call them gangsters or the mafia or whatever, but people who are business people and politicians and violence workers, part of this network. And basically what Dave McGowan said about Gacy is that the graveyard under his house was like, he killed people. Yes, he killed people. He raped people. He was a bad guy, but the graveyard under his house was like a business he was running and you could go and bury your body with Gacy. Gacy was basically like, uh, taking care of dead bodies for people. That was his role in the business, the violence business network that he was in. And that, okay, uh, I am speculating. I think you're allowed to speculate in this, this country still. That, uh, And it's not slander and you can't get sued. You know, so please don't sue me. Uh, also, I'll take this down. Just send a cease and desist letter. I'll just take whatever you want down. I, I really am not that invested in this. Also, uh, thank you. Junior, for your investigative work and your podcast, and uh, I will remove, take this down, and remove the clip from your podcast if you don't want it to be there. Uh, I feel that uh, you know we did have some discussions, you know, on on Twitter, so I feel you would reach out to me and let me know if you have a problem with any anything I'm doing or anything I'm representing, and and we can remedy it, hopefully through discussion. Uh, same goes out to Sam Amirante. I guess I, I had less of a sympathetic tone towards you but if you have a problem with what what i'm doing you let me know and we'll just have it out you know the good old communication 
uh, de-escalation. Anyway, uh, that all being said, my speculation is that, you know, Dave McGowan said Gacy's running a graveyard business for clandestine graveyard. They want to have a controlled demolition of the graveyard business because Gacy is so flagrant and violating the law and exposing himself. Uh, and uh, we didn't get into all of the people who disappeared mysteriously after interacting with Gacy. Many of the families of these young men who disappeared called the police and, and insisted they go investigate Gacy. And that stuff really gets covered a lot in, in some of the documentaries and whatnot and books that, that I'm going to plug a little later, so I won't get into that too much. But what if they want to have a controlled demolition of Gacy and they either set up Sam Amirante at, uh, or Sam Amirante was uh, a uh, co-conspirator in getting this confession from Gacy, maybe when he was hypnotized, maybe when he was just fucked up, uh, may you know. But what what is going on? If your your attorney is there an hour later after you're confessing, it's it's kind of weird, you know. It's like why wasn't why didn't why did Sam Amirante sit there for another confession? That, you can't argue with. That's not speculation. That's part of the thing. And. Uh, uh yeah I, I didn't read that section of amirante's book yet i'm gonna read amirante's book i think there has to be a part two because because i want to follow up some of these loose ends i don't know if it's better to move the podcast along or just to make a gacy podcast or whatever but maybe we could get an interview going with uh Bob Mata jr and defense diaries and and maybe he'll he'll provide some guidance about what to do about this but anyway what happened to sam amirante after he is uh Gacy's lawyer and Gacy gets the death penalty. So uh he runs for Illinois Senate. He gets slated on the Democratic Party slate uh to run for the Illinois State Senate. And I think that should say 1983. I think it was in 1983 that he started running and this that article this article came out in 1983. But one of the things that he's really into is um the L law this this new computer shit for cops so it says uh that he's running for candidate i got notoriety for defending gacy and it says uh being an attorney in that case i saw problems the different police departments had coordinating their investigations he said then i watched the movie adam about a child abduction oh that's something to watch uh, I'm going to do a movie episode for the podcast. In my living room with my sons around, and that drove the point home. I started writing the legislation as a private citizen the next morning. Amirante also decided to run for the state senate, saying, I figured if I was going to get involved that far, I might as well go the rest of the way and run for office. He declared himself a candidate last December. So he didn't declare himself a candidate. The Democratic Party slated him. That's, I mean, even in 83... That's still how it worked. So Amirante's proposal, dubbed iSearch, called for expanding a law enforcement computer network already in place to include information on missing children and known child molesters, abolishing the unwritten 24-hour wait rule by requiring police to report missing children to the network immediately and extending the definition of missing children, quote unquote, to include all minors, minors under age 21. State Senator President, State Senate President Phil Rock, Democrat Oak Park, and House Speaker Michael Madigan. Got that Kill Bill siren going. Wow, wow. Uh, Mike, Mikey Madigan is a machine. Uh, Lovecraftian machine. Old God. He's spoken about in hushed tones still. So Mikey Madigan sponsored, just like Marzullo or whatever, Burke, they're, they're like, they're hoary ghosts, hoary ghosts. And he's still supposed to, he's supposed to be getting indicted, supposed to go to jail. Mikey Madigan sponsored Amirante's measure in April. Kustra quickly took up sponsorship of a similar manager, and um, Kustra is the Republican who he's running against. 
and Amirante and Kustra spent the ensuing months arguing over which bill was better. That really upset me that Amirante was like stealing one of my kids. <laughs> I would I mean I wouldn't have said that. I mean it's like this way it's supposed to be about these uh youths and uh database or whatever i mean i wouldn't have admitted that i wanted my name on the bill the final bill not having been in politics i don't think sam understands the legislative process said kustra of des plains a professor of political science at illinois chicago oh uic but i guess that's the only thing he had to talk about uh governor thompson ended the quarrel by signing both measures into law Appropriating 1.9 million for the administration of the program, more than twice as much as either piece of legislation called for. Amirante is now using approval of his measure as a centerpiece of his campaign. So we have to we have the ability to look at the lens of this um computer database from with hindsight. And uh let's look first. From a literary perspective, uh, let's look from the, the perspective of the Pinchon fans, my fellow podcasters, uh, Jimmy Fallon Gong, Khaled, and Dimitri, they all love Pinchon. Uh, they introduced me to it. The great uh, movie, uh, Doc Sportello uh, in California. My brain is, is just fogging, but it's, it's the Thomas Pynchon movie. One of the things he gets access to is, uh, like a, like a, an early law enforcement internet network. That's a big feature of the book. And there's all these, um, vectors from the military research into computers for the purposes of counterinsurgency that just that spread outward into into vessels vessels for their counterinsurgency designs and we can look backwards from the vantage point of 2022 at the gang database the fusion centers that uh i personally i was involved in a bit of activism uh in my time against you know the cursed tito in chief you know got pretty excited about that and got involved in the immigration struggle one of the things that um was really a frustration was that the illinois sanctuary state laws supposedly protecting the information of undocumented immigrants from being shared with ice they were it was like uh they were like a sieve because there's so many of these federal databases that are just uh i'm doing the fingers interlocking fingers they're interlocked with the local databases that it's impossible to stop any computer information entered into a computer at the state level from being shared with the whole federal level. So one of the things they have is the NCIC, National Crime Information Center, and the state police officer explained that they entered an undocumented immigrant's information into the NCIC computer because it's standard practice to run someone's name through the computer whenever you have a police interaction. And this person, basically this person got in a traffic accident and the other, they were like, Hey, let's just settle this. And then the other person was like, Oh shit, this guy's probably undocumented. I could get him deported. And then I'm not going to have to pay for his car to get fixed. Pretty petty shit. Uh, offensive kind of thing that, you know, that, that, uh, the angst, angst of Chicago, you know, just screwing somebody over for a minor convenience. It's, it's, in the air here you know I'm not, i love this city but it happens and that's what happened so he called the cops the cops came out they put this guy's name in the ncic computer and then uh, a week or so later ice came and got him from his house because they dinged that whatever however their algorithm works they put his name in the computer and somehow they dinged that they could come and get him that he is, could be he let got lifted up in the priority of people because they i guess they knew he was in illinois or something like that and they knew his address so it was simple enough to pick this person up so i don't think i shared too much personal information for myself or someone else but basically these computers are black boxes we don't know what they're really for and so this i search was an i didn't research it at all i didn't have time i would have liked to have researched it more but 
this is another thing to follow up on. How was iSearch connected to the expansion of the surveillance state of the, um, uh, like one of the things you, there's a book surveillance Valley or whatever, uh, about how, how the, the, this idea, basically what the, what, what was cooked up was for the Phoenix program for counterinsurgency. They started off with cabinets full of file cards. Uh, I mean, it goes back, uh, very far, but the, the French in the Algerian war, they kind of, um, developed the, the theory and they wrote a book about it where they called it La Guerre Revolutionnaire and they call it Revolutionary War. And the idea is that you make a diagram of all the social connections of the enemy population, the, um, the resistors, the fighters, whatever, you have to make a diagram of all of their social connections in the community. And then you can eradicate not only the, the actual person who pulls the trigger, but all of their support. And this became kind of the, uh, the motivation uh, of the Phoenix program where they did this in Vietnam. They called it the Viet Cong Infrastructure, VCI, Viet Cong Civilian Infrastructure. It was basically all the people supporting the Viet Cong fighter uh, in the field who were administrators in the underground governments or whatever. But the idea is that it's about mapping um, connections of people for the purposes of the counterinsurgency. And am I going to say like, oh, a database of missing children is that? have to research it to understand what this database was all about but uh you can't just off the bat say oh it was only about the missing kids or whatever i mean it could have just been kind of a a vehicle for just expanding the general capabilities for data gathering and databases of the police and in a way it's, it sounds like it's kind of like or just just an excuse to buy the computers and bury the wires and then it's going to become the gang database later on or whatever. This is speculation. I am trying to own that. It's a lot of work to go and just go on newspaper.com and read every single article sequentially about some topic because, you know, nobody's really written a explainer of it. But basically, this is in the subliminal jihad program to chill lexicon. This is sus. Being associated to eye search is sus. The other thing that even some of the, the documentaries that uh, focus solely on Gacy's crimes, they pointed out that like it wasn't just people. And, and uh, at the end of this, we're going to go over all the kind of the extra information, extra sources that um, are highly critical of the official narrative and worth looking into. But um, a lot of the people who either disappeared their families went to the police and said, go to this, get this fucking guy, Gacy. And I think um, uh, some of the families were talking about just going and getting Gacy themselves, that it got to that point. And so it wasn't like about like, uh, there is this weird shit in a lot of the documentaries they had where they interviewed police officers. And I think they even interviewed some politicians and they were talking about, oh, it's the 60s. It was the 70s, the hippies, everybody was running away. They were hippies, so the cops didn't pay attention to these missing persons reports because they were just running away to be hippies. And, like, you could turn that around on its head, uh, do a 180 and be like, oh, the cops decided not to look into missing persons reports because of the changing cultural attitudes. They looked at the missing persons reports as an, ex you know, they looked at this new hippie culture as an excuse to not look into the missing persons reports, you know. So, uh, again, uh, I am speculating here. If anyone is going to sue me, just DM me on Twitter and I will take this all down or just complain to YouTube and have them take it down. Okay. Don't sue me. I don't have any money. You don't have to make me suffer just for, just for speculating about some ideas, you know, uh, just send me a DM and, and, and tell me that you're going to sue me and, and I'll take it all down and uh come wash your car detail the interior whatever whatever you want you know come hang out in your uh uh you know uh basement uh 
home bar or whatever and wrestle whenever you want. Anyway, so uh yeah, just like oh, so you defend John Wayne Gacy, there's a nice controlled demolition of his uh empire of money making in the uh possibly you know, Dave McGowan, not me. Dave McGowan said he was running a for-profit graveyard for the underworld. And whatever was going on with his associates and his businesses was nice and controlled demolition. Then a few years later, you run for office uh, on this platform of bringing computers into law enforcement. Again, you, you, we have to do the reverse Phoenix program and map out the connections and the, the, the institutions and the people, especially the names of people who who got this bill into his hands, because he didn't just write it after in his spare time or whatever. He won in '84, right? Obviously, the bill passes. Uh, missing bill kids, missing kids bill. Okay, let's read through this. Might be worth reading. Legislation to tighten Illinois' missing children statutes gained unanimous approval this week in executive committees. Okay, that's right. Does that mean a close? Okay, I got to look up a little more about. This. Also, our whole legislative system is is very opaque. Uh, I was when I, I think I said already I was trying to research how many precinct captains were in Norwood Park Township, uh, in when when Gacy was active, and it was like they had been redistricted so many times. It was like this. It was like a nightmare i would have had to get all the newspaper articles describing the the redistrictings and like work backwards from the current map to the old map the bill would create regional illinois state enforcement agencies to recover children i search a specialized task force made up of local police officers to investigate cases of lost missing and runaway children from newborns to 21 years old it amends other child protection statutes and current civil administrative statutes it further authorizes the illinois department of law enforcement to partially fund the efforts of local law enforcement agencies cooperation with iSearch and it imposes certain reporting duties upon idle and law enforcement agencies the bill's author curiously is not a lawmaker but a democratic candidate for state senate this november attorney sam almirante of park ridge who is seeking election in the 28th district in addition to forming a specialized regional task force on the umbrella of idle, a key element of the bill calls for elimination of unwritten 24 to 72 hour waiting period practiced by local law enforcement agencies in dealing with missing children and juveniles. Uh, current practices call for that ridiculous waiting period from the time the child is discovered missing and the official police report of the incident. Amarante said, such a delay results in tragic consequences. In a 24 hour period, a child can be abducted and speared away from the country or worse. Uh, missing child report go proper regional eye search agency and into the regional and centralized state come oh I don't have the second half of this but it's into the computers so this thing I don't know what is this 24 to 72 hour waiting period I, I think there's they still have that today so I don't think it's, I mean there are people going missing today it's a big problem missing women and girls and whatnot uh, I think they still have this 24 hour waiting period uh, the other thing is that I think this 24 hour waiting period 24 to what is a 24 to 7 how can a law change an unwritten waiting period and the other thing is that i am not a lawyer but uh i try to keep abreast of the different rules you know especially uh around um when you can be detained and what's a stop and what's an arrest or whatever but uh like if if someone is like if you strongly think that someone is uh so you can detain someone and, and question them and stop them if you think they're committing a crime, right? So if you have some strong reason to suspect that uh, a child is kidnapped, you don't have to wait 24 hours if the parents are telling you, John Wayne Gacy uh, disappeared my kid. Uh, you know, he's his my kid's car is parked around the corner from his house. Yeah, John Wayne Gacy stole uh, one of the people he's murdered's car uh uh one of his employees we killed and the family like reported it and he gave the car to uh mike rossi his other employee and we'll, we'll get into that a little later when we talk about mike rossi well this is about computers and databases and money for computers for the police uh i gotta look into it but you can't assume off the bat it was even really gonna 
be oriented towards missing children or if it was going to be uh like gang database stuff or if it was just you know it's hard to say but yeah so this guy before he's even elected he's he's got a uh state computer database bill co-sponsored by michael madigan uh sounds like some machine shit oh here's the second part okay so I search agency, both regional and centralized state computers, the law enforcement agencies, data system has the capability of handling all this information, Amirante said. So this is kind of beginning to seem as though law enforcement agency data system. Uh, I got to look. I think that might they might still have that. I got to look. I got to research it more. But it sounds like this data system would not have been just for missing children. It would be for everything. So this is like a part of the. And the net the network boom and the computer boom uh that was like part of the cold war and shit immediate reporting of many missing child means immediate action the case will be open without delay even if it's a suspected runaway it doesn't matter investigators will be on it right away so the computer isn't going to do that automatically but in addition, the bill calls for all police departments, whether they are active contributors to the iSearch group or not, to be required to share all information with IDLE about missing children, sex offenders, or any other data deemed necessary and helpful in a missing child investigation. That's done now on a strictly volunteer basis, he said. All other aspects of the legislation call for iSearch investigators to go undercover in the active pursuit of runaways. They would attempt to, infil they would attempt to infiltrate prostitution and narcotics rings and work hand-in-hand -in -hand with other related agencies, such as the Metropolitan Enforcement Group and others. Uh, what? So this is creating like an undercover police unit and a bunch of police computers. And they're infiltrating prostitution and narcotics rings. I am a big fan of Douglas Valentine, and he wrote a great book about the FBN, the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. I think it's it's called something something the wolf. Uh you can Google it. Douglas Valentine's the author. And he wrote the Phoenix program too. It's really interesting because it talks about how the FBN was less of like I mean, even more so than the DEA. It was just obviously corrupt and obviously almost like a trade association for regulating drug dealing and making sure that it was done in the right way rather than preventing it and uh i think it was very scandal plagued and part of the reason they made the dea was that the fbn was so clearly working hand in glove with the mafia and shit so when you've got a law enforcement agency you never heard of like the metropolitan enforcement group uh you have to go and investigate so uh yeah we're gonna have more episodes for each side of the hypercube and I don't know when they're going to come out, but they're going to come out. So local governments will bear some of the funding costs of iSearch, but it will be additionally funded by state grants. According to Amirante, members of both the state house and Senate are pushing hard in a bipartisan effort for the passage of the Intergovernmental Missing Child Recovery Act of 1984. Amirante is no stranger to the pain and agony of missing children. He was one of the defense attorneys representing John Wayne Gacy, the convicted mass slayer of young boys. It's kind of interesting also that, that when did they go from being John Gacy to being John Wayne Gacy? Because all the contemporary reporting reported him as John Gacy. Something to look into. It's a bill we should have thought of and put into action a long time ago. There never would have been a Gacy case if something like this had existed. So what? How are the computers gonna help with the Gacy case and these like this uh another mod squad like another independent investigatory task force that's gonna be infiltrating? narcotics and prostitution rings it, it seems very suspicious to me uh, i'm a police abolitionist so i'm always suspicious of the police but in this situation i think even without my bias you can fit it into a, a framework of what is policing but last october's airing of the television movie adam the true story of adam walsh so why does every article mention this movie uh I gotta go check this movie out a, a fl and this is probably some like some satanic panic shit where it's like i i believe you know in the dialectic 
dialectical materialism, you know, there was a satanic movement of tolerated and uh, of tolerated violence. And then there was this uh, right wing Christian movement that was supposed to respond to it, but both were kind of targeted uh, against different populations, uh, you know, oppressing workers. The bourgeoisie was pulling the strings on both. George Bush, among, first among equals, and the bourgeoisie was pulling the strings. Not get lost in the sauce, though. Credited a South... Okay, so he saw this movie. It really pulled on his heartstrings. Credited a South Suburban Organization, Protect the Children, Inc. Of Mo... Something to look into. Of Mokina, providing the... Oh, providing the lion's share of the research that was incorporated into the bill. All right, that's something to look up. It's mind-boggling to learn that nearly 2 million children are reported missing annually in this country. Even more sobering is the statistic that the average child molester assaults 68 children before he is arrested with them. Be fucked up if that's true. Amirante said. So, you know, again, also, I said some, uh, was a little bit critical on Twitter of the, uh, the wrong about team, uh, their handling of the, uh, one, one of these program to kill related cases. But I do, I, I think that, um, you know, you have to be critical of these, uh, not for profits coming out with sweeping statements about the prevalence of, of human trafficking. And that uh, they have pointed out, I think, quite aptly that the uh, uh, abuse starts at home. The human trafficking is often fitting into a more traditional, less sensational relationship of abuse, such as a boyfriend abusing a girlfriend or, you know, and then that is uh, that becomes a business when it's rooted in the traditional misogyny. Uh, and and uh, patriarchy, but it it ends up becoming a business, and then uh, that is like the vast majority is kind of like this uh, quote unquote trafficking that is very much situated in patriarchy and lives there comfortably. So, and that they said something like that's the vast majority of it. Uh, yeah, I think you got to think about also, like, even if that's the vast majority, you know, if there's like more corporate vertically integrated human trafficking operations, if that's 10% of the human trafficking or whatever, yeah, we got to address the patriarchy and shit. It's fucked up. And, uh, these small human trafficking things are probably facilitating these, you know, more bigger ones or whatever. But anyway, you got it. And, but I, and they point out that there's a lot of like very specious statistics out there where they're estimating how many children are at risk for human trafficking by like double counting all the children in, in a urban area or something. Uh, you know, so you gotta be critical dialectically. You gotta be dialectical and critical rambling a little bit here. Let's finish up this article and call it for, but anyway, I, I got respect for the, you're wrong about people. I tried to show it in the, my response that I had some respect for their methods and, uh, whatnot. But I also had some criticism for how they handled this particular case, uh, which I think um, involved like minimizing the network of enablers around a serial killer. And I think we should examine that network of enablers. And that network of enablers could be the patriarchy. In many cases, it is. In you know, 89% of cases, it's the patriarchy. And then it's, it's some kind of uh, newer, more streamlined, corporatized patriarchal institution in the other 11% that that is sensational in some ways, but we shouldn't just sensationalize it and ignore the other 89%, but we shouldn't have some kind of uh, naive rejection of its importance uh, that, that there are these uh, well-oiled uh, machines of uh, uh, human abuse, you know, like uh, I'm not going to, name all the examples or whatever but you know there's been a lot in the news uh the google i get one of the google departments was a cult where they were abusing women or something came out recently uh he called for dedication across the state for to protecting children from such assaults by fine-tuning our methods of recovering abducted children and by cracking down on offenders authored in january 
and sponsored in early April. The bill is moving quickly through the legislative process to gain far reaching support from all corners of the state. Amirante commented on the bill's sponsor, Senate President Philip J. Rock, House Speaker Michael Madigan. Okay, so Michael Madigan, everybody knows, real scumbag. Gotta look in this Philip J. Rock guy, see what's going on with him. Best and a host of legislatures from crowds around the state, including State Senator George Sangmeister, who supported introduction of the legislation and presented testimony and documentation before the committees. I'm gratified that both committees have approved the important legislation. He said, we in Illinois, as in other parts of the country, have been painfully aware of the flaws and laws protecting our children from abduction. We believe the new law provides a clamp to tighten the screws on child abductors in a state. So the bill could become a law by July. So it's create. I mean, it's it's fall. You know, this I search. I gotta research it more and look into all these uh, people more. And we're probably gonna do that for a, for a law enforcement episode side of the the hypercube. And frankly, we didn't even look enough into uh, the side of the hypercube we're examining today, which is uh, the uh, elected officials and their lackeys. So, 1988, Sa Sam. Mirante as a member, as a precinct captain, then elected official. Now, in 1988, he has been nominated to become a judge. Becoming a judge uh, is like the, the pinnacle of machine reward, you know? This is Mike Royko. Uh, yeah, it'd be cool. I wish I, uh, I could look up how many times he talks about judges in his book. He talks a lot about judges and how getting judges, putting judges in, becoming a judge. That's what the machine's all about. You seed these people throughout the legal system, and they're like the, the, uh, the real heavy hitters of your impunity. You know, that's why it's called a machine. You know, like an impunity machine. It's a machine. That's that's perpetuating itself, you know, in many complicated parts. You know, you got all kind of pressure valves and regulators and stuff, and the judges are very key parts of the machine. And uh sort of oddly enough, uh during some kind of push for more minorities on the bench, uh Sam Amirante was uh, appointed. I would be curious to know if his uh uh Italian American activism and identity uh, politics played a role in his self advocacy around this time or in his responses to reporters. Uh, the archives, man, digging in the archives. You just, you never know what you're going to see, but you, you got to touch grass too. But basically, Sam Amirante became a judge. And uh, I think I have a few. Uh, so, this judge died, Richard Salzman, and uh, Amirante said uh, he's a Cook County Circuit Court judge, 3rd District. He was a great person and a great judge, said defense attorney Sam Amirante. They should all have that vigor and vitality on the bench. He will be missed. Uh, judge Salzman of Skokie collapsed in his judicial chambers in the Norwich branch of Circuit Court shortly after 9 a.m. So it's kind of funny. I think that I have a feeling that Sam Amirante kind of took over this guy's judgeship. Uh, it's kind of funny, like, that's how most of this stuff happens, because they usually are not run running these judges in competitive elections. The machine kind of slates people for the judgeships, uh, and they run unopposed. So it's kind of funny, like, this judge died, they interview the next judge. Nice quote for the obit. Kind of funny. Uh... Plan commissioners favor $2.5 million development. A proposed $2.5 million luxury townhouse planned unit development was favored by the Lake Geneva Plan Commission Monday night. On two separate notes, the commission recommended 6 to 0 that the city council rezone 2.5 acres at blah blah. Sam Amirante. Oh, yeah. Uh, I skipped up. The uh, only relevant part. Okay. That, that, that the city council rezone 2.5 acres at Main and West Street from R2 to R4. Sam Amirante, owner of land at Main and West Streets, and architect Louis Galante, uh, both of Park Ridge, Illinois, said the planned unit development calls for 24 luxury townhouses and three buildings plus a swimming hole. So this is kind of the classic way to get money as an elected official, get a zoning change, 
you own some land that was less valuable before whatever went through the electoral aspect and now it's more valuable so i think nancy pelosi's made a shitload of money he didn't exactly sell land that he owned to some government project but i guess they're rezoning it and he maybe could make some money from the rezoning i'm making a little land deal that's another reward 2.5 million i don't know if that's per unit or for the whole thing but that's a nice chunk of change and uh yeah so sam amirante has clout i think we can say that ross Dankowski's daughter convicted so the 32 year old daughter of u.s rep dan ross Dankowski has pleaded guilty to shoplifting pet toys valued at 40 dollars from the north side supermarket a state's attorney's office spokeswoman said wednesday uh rostin was arrested in december sorry gail rostin oh she changed her name Rostin from Rostinkowski, I guess. Uh, Gail Rostin of 1120 North LaSalle Street was sentenced to nine months of court supervision, $90 fine, after pleading guilty last Thursday in misdemeanor court before Associate Judge Sam Amirante. Rostin was arrested in December when she tried to leave a club food store at 2627 North Elston Ave without paying for several dog toys she had hidden on her clothes, according to police. Sue, is this a slap on the wrist? Kind of seems like it. Uh, and Ross Dinkowski, uh, I didn't get the article into the PowerPoint, but he did, uh, donate a bunch of money to, uh, Martwick, Robert Martwick, the big boss ward committeeman. And Martwick was quoted as something like, uh, and I think Ross Dinkowski ended up getting prosecuted. And then, uh, Robert Martwick had accepted money from him and he made some remark about like, oh, I accepted that money for the democratic organization. It was a donation. It was for the good of the community, you know, typical uh, shithead Chicago politician thing about like, uh, you know, responding in a very flippant way when you're questioned about uh, uh, your associations. So one thing uh, to say about Sam Amirante, he was known as the hugging judge. Not so fast. Judge Sam Amirante, whose reputation as the quote unquote hugging judge seems to be spreading far and wide. He recently got a call from Bill Cosby's producers asking him to be a contestant on the comedian's remake of the old Groucho Marx You Bet Your Life show scheduled for this fall. So another nice association, John Gacy, Bill Cosby. Like I said, I'm not slandering this guy. Stuff's in the newspaper. It's reading the newspaper to you. Recycling the content through the, uh, you know, the nightmare vortex of the internet to hopefully someday make some money. But like I said, Sam, please sue me. Or no, don't sue me, Sam. Do not sue me. I didn't say anything uh, against you. I read, I, I observed facts that were publicly available. If you send me a cease and desist letter, though, I will take everything down. But you have to do it sooner rather than later. You got to register your objection immediately. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be as binding later on. So we have avoided discussing uh john wayne gacy's crimes i mean well the crimes is the wrong word because people talk about crime you know crime is a social construct what is a crime this whole thing is about i'm about to talk about police impunity so crimes are what the police define as crimes violence uh maybe even violence is the wrong word harm the harm that john gacy caused we have not gotten into the explicit details we are going to be talking a little bit about it right now uh Jeffrey Rignall was a survivor of John Wayne Gacy's uh, sexual assault and rape. Uh, John Gacy approached him in uptown Chicago, on the, or maybe in Boys Town. They're very nearby neighborhoods. And uh, I didn't get into the counterinsurgency angle against uptown and Boys Town, because these were very politically active neighborhoods, uh, especially in the kind of Black Panther civil rights era. But uh, I didn't have too much specific stuff on that, so I mean, it's just a it's just a fact that the the a lot of the kind of militant uh, activists were here. Uh, the young patriots who joined the the Fred Hampton's Rainbow Coalition, certainly a group probably deserving of more scrutiny than they have received. Uh, they just kind of got a reputation as like, oh yeah, they're the the good white people, is like the white Black Panthers or whatever. Uh, it's not maybe they deserve a little more scrutiny and, and also some investigation of a 
in uh, uplifting nature. Uh, more needs to be said about them. But anyway, that that's uptown for you. So Rignall, he got offered a joint by John Gacy, and then uh, he's smoking a joint with Gacy. Gacy takes out a chloroform rag and shoves it on his face. We're going to see in the next picture. I avoided graphic photos for the most part, but I think it's important to the story that his face was completely burned by this chloroform. It's a very caustic chemical, and uh, uh, maybe it's possible to apply chloroform in a way that doesn't do this, but Gacy was not concerned about that. He used an excess of chloroform, and it burned the guy's skin off. So uh, he knocked him out with his chloroform, took him to the house, and, and uh, raped him, and, and then uh, took him back to uptown, just left him in the park or whatever. And uh, so Rigno was really incensed by this. The police uh, took pictures of him and stuff, but they didn't show any interest in investigating. Rignall investigated the crime himself, basically. We're going to read a quote from the uh, Man Who Killed Boys, the book I like. Uh, Rignall rented a car and drove to the expressway exit he remembered from the night of his abduction and rape. He spent 4 to 15 hours a day for about two weeks searching streets in the area for the car or sitting by the exit, sometimes accompanied by friends waiting for it to drive by. His patience finally paid off when the black Oldsmobile turned off the expressway one day and passed him. He jotted down the license number and followed the Oldsmobile. The car turned into a driveway at 8213 West Summerdale Avenue. That's Gacy's house. So this guy investigated this shit himself. And uh, this is how his face looked. It's got burns all over. It's got swelling. Uh, and it's it's like it, the burns are like chemical burns, basically. It's like the skin is shiny and, and the top layer is off. You know, or the... Uh, I'm not going to leave it up there, but his, his face looks totally fucked up. And it was, it was very obvious when he went and got these photos taken that this was not a consensual sexual encounter. But even after he found Gacy, the police ignored his report. Uh, and the Des Plaines police that claim that nobody, I don't remember if it involved the Des Plaines police or not, but uh, he ended up suing Gacy with a private attorney for the cost of his medical care and Gacy ended up settling with him for some pittance, you know, so it's all quite, um, it, it, it was like, so there's a, so there's, it comes back to the, you're wrong about pattern of the patriarchy versus the secret conspiracy, right? There's a, there's a, uh, the police are notoriously, uh, disbelieving of the victims of, uh, rape and sexual assault minimizing uh reveal actually a very nice podcast did a good a series about this that was uh you know quite quite uh well researched and incontrovertible proof that the the police were taking uh uh sexual assault cases where the the perpetrator the person who did the sexual assault had confessed to the police in an interview yeah i did it uh i'm not gonna get into the details or whatever but they basically said i did it and then the cops um, quashed it, essentially, and said, oh, well, this was... And they used some loopholes to say that the case was off the books, even though it was never resolved. Uh, and it, they said something like, like it, it came down to like 5% of the uh, rapes or sexual assaults were actually um, prosecuted by the, from the reporting so the, there is a patriarchal attitude of disbelief of the survivors uh and i suppose in this case there was also people who didn't survive that that were not taken their their uh the, the the harm caused them was not well not not there's not concern or care about that harm either but uh so you have the attitude but at the same time uh there is that five percent that gets prosecuted or whatever and this person found the perpetrator served him up on a platter he had photos of all his injuries this seems like very bizarre that it was not prosecuted and it was also part of a pattern with gacy that there were other times that he had been um sexually assaulting uh people and they complained to the police and he ended up with a disorderly conduct or for, for one of these charges and again like uh you know it's it's uh it's, it's an astounding level of police impunity i didn't research it as much i think that if we do the police slash counterinsurgency episode 
we are going to be focusing on what I'm about to talk about and on that eye search stuff. Uh, I don't want to go into the catalog of, of everyone Gacy harmed and, uh, and how the police uh, did nothing and how there was clear evidence. I think that some of the people that... Um, Got th sorry, I was coughing again. Some of the documentaries that I'm going to recommend at the end and Cav Def, they've got those resources there to go through. Uh, I said at the beginning, you know, for me, the true crime, uh, yes, that, it, that, that in some way you think about the victims and honoring their memory. But to me, this is about the enablers and condemning them and raising the awareness of these enabling networks around these people committing massive harm. You know, and it's a bit like, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think it's a bit like, uh, Nancy Pelosi said something about, uh, 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 George Floyd, that he was a, uh, activist who, um, who sacrificed his life for, uh, civil rights or something. And, uh, that's not accurate. George Floyd did not seek out some kind of uh, confrontation with the police for the purposes of uh, demonstrating a civil rights point. He was uh, sought out and harmed. And, uh, you know, I didn't research this at all, but, but you get the point is that Gacy went out and found people to harm. They didn't want to like, uh, you know, they, they were not willingly included in that story, you know? So, so I have a sensitivity for them, but I'm not trying to like, like, uh, like, you know, that's to me. It's it's not about the victims. It's about the, and it's also not about glorifying John Wayne Gacy Ubermensch. He fooled us all. It's about he didn't fool anyone. He was very obvious in his his uh the harms he did. He was careless, and there's a big network of enablers around him, and that they probably did. The, and it seems like they did a controlled demolition on him to to bury all their connections to him along with him, uh because uh. And that probably there are people who are operating more smoothly, who enjoyed total impunity. I've certainly heard anecdotal reports in my travels in Chicago about uh, local small business tyrants who were monsters in the community and abused youth and, and others. Uh, but that all being said, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to get, get too confrontational or controversial. But like I said, you know, you let me know what you think about what I'm saying and, and uh, I'll respond to principled critiques and... Uh, uh, if there's something I've said that's, that's inappropriate and you convince me with logic or with threats, then I'll take it out, re-upload. Uh, and if it's, you know, convince me with well-intentioned communication that, oh, you said this thing that was wrong, it was harmful, I will apologize, you know. If you threaten to sue me for uh, implying that you're part of uh, uh, some nefarious activity, uh, I will just take it down. But I'm not going to apologize. That's where I draw the line. Uh, buried dreams inside the mind of a serial killer, Tim Cahill. Uh, I didn't get a chance to read much of this book because I found it at the very end, but there's quite a few, um, fascinating facts in here. I didn't get to follow up on one in high school. John, what John Wayne Gacy was a civil defense captain. Uh, a boyhood friend remembers he pretty much organized the whole thing, like for fire drills where each fire marshal to stand to make sure everyone got out civil defense captains got a portable flashing blue light they could put on the dashboard of their cars to use on official business the civil defense is under the off the office of civilian defense the ocd and it's the sister organization of the civil air patrol the bill siren okay uh the civil air patrol lee harvey oswald barry seal david ferry uh, this is like the cousin of the civil air patrol for land. And, uh, it's under the same umbrella, the OCD, the office of civilian defense. I think that's what it's called. There's an article on the next page. Yeah. What the fuck? Why was John Wayne Gacy in this sister org of the civil air patrol? It also says that it, he was a precinct captain, uh, assistant. He worked as an assistant precinct captain on behalf of the Democratic candidate for alderman in the 45th Ward. And um, this guy, I think I lined, I didn't get the chance to do the research totally, 
but I lined up the timeline slightly in the 45th word alderman like uh died suddenly and had like a diary full of uh letters to his mistress or something that caused a big scandal in the papers so what the fuck's going on there that's something to look into uh I wish I would have found this book right away but um it's on archive.org if you want to check it out if you want to make your own John Wayne Gacy episode read this book uh follow find the social networks of all the people in it who give you weird vibes and make your own episode this is something I would have liked to have looked into. What, what was going on with the assistant priest and captain shit in the 45th ward? What was going on with the civil defense? Uh, I have a little bit to say about the civil defense. Uh, the civil, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, the civil air patrol cap, which was created just days before the attack on Pearl Harbor, commissioned civilian pilots to patrol the coast and borders and engage in search and rescue missions. The civil defense corps run by the OCD uh, organized approximately 10 million volunteers who trained us to fight fires, decontaminate after chemical weapon attacks, provide first aid and other duties. Uh, so, within the, the Office of Civilian Defense, within the Office of Emergency Planning, in the Executive Office of the President. Uh, uh, the Civil Defense of World War II began very much as a continuation of that of World War I. Very interesting, because John Wayne Gacy's father, John Gacy Sr., was also a World War I veteran, uh, and it seemed like he had PTSD from that. He uh, had a locked basement where he would go and drink by himself and supposedly rant and rave. Um, this, uh, I'm pretty, I, this, this, I think that C Civil Air Patrol is also in the under the OCD. It doesn't say that explicitly here, but I have to do a little more research on that. Um, these are some articles. Uh, 1955, Bridgeport News. So that's Mayor Daly's neighborhood. It's one of the most reactionary neighborhoods in Chicago to this day. During the George Floyd uprising, they had a big roving mob of people holding pipes and bats who, uh, I think, uh, at least they got pictures of them on the news, just mobbed up like that. Uh, I went and walked around in the neighborhood. It's very tense and standoffish uh there there was like vigilante violence during the george floyd uprising that was uh reported in the news so i don't know if these all were involved in some and didn't get caught or what but uh here's an article about the civil air patrol the idea of air raid drills for employees and factories and businesses is growing, the Chicago Civil Defense Corps said today. Many business firms have asked for specific recommendations as to how their internal civil defense organization may participate in, quote-unquote, Operation Alert 1955. And on June 15th, Anthony J. Mullaney, Chicago CD director, uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, in view of these... So this is weird, like the businesses have a civil defense thing that's going to come in and train people about uh and i didn't read all these but about like when nuclear weapons and chemical weapons get used it's it sounds like uh like a union you know nice vehicle for some union busting in view of these inquiries a supplement of the chicago civil defense corps plan of exercise has been prepared by pat kelly core 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 coordinator and mailed to all commercial and industrial firms. Each firm and state should decide for itself the type and extent of its participation, but it is stressed that all should view the assumed bombing as if it actually might happen. So this year's exercise is the first to contemplate use of the hydrogen bomb. Uh, radioactive fallout. Each firm's civil defense committee to consider modifications of organization and plans in light of the new factors of evacuation and radioactive fallout. Okay, so we have Pat Kelly, and I'm pretty sure this is the Pat Kelly of the Kelly Nash machine that was the, uh, the Democratic Party machine that preceded Daly's one-man machine, one-man control. Uh, he is preparing the Chicago Civil Defense Corps plan and this is getting sent to every big factory so that they can organize their own civil defense uh, committee and um, uh, spy on their coworkers and, and make them do weird rituals 
slash drills where they practice getting blown up by an atomic bomb. I mean, this, this seems like, like, like a vehicle for right wing clandestine organizing. And like I said, I need to research it more. Uh, 55, John Wayne Gacy would have been 13. So it's possible that it sounded like he was driving in that other book. So he might not have been in high school yet. Anyway. Here's a news clip. Seize eight minute warning when a bombs fell. Fall. Colonel John Galt. Uh, what the fuck? <laughs> John Galt, what? Assistant military advisor to the Civil Defense Office in Washington said yesterday that with the normal functioning of air raid warning signals, the population of an atomic bomb target area would have eight minutes to find shelter. Galt addressed civil defense directors of all states attending the opening session of the Edgewater Beach Hotel of the General Assembly of the State's Council of State Governments. That's wild, because I think I know this hotel, and it's um, it's like a, a Art Deco kind of, but it's bright pink. It kind of, it's got a vibe like that Miami beachfront vibe. It's really trippy. Imagining this Colonel John Galt uh, losing his shit at the podium about how long exactly you have before the bomb blows you to smithereens. Big plane flight spotted. 40 unidentified bombers were picked up Wednesday on the radar screen at the main Canadian border, said Galt, at 32,000 feet. He said three hours later they were identified as United States planes. That warning went all the way to the security line in the White House, he said. We had them on the radar screen from 9 a.m. So this is a high-level military intelligence guy uh, giving an address in Chicago to these... Uh, Civil defense organizations that are organized by factory. Kind of, kind of fashy vibe here. Uh, VFW Post sets up Civilian Defense Corps. The Englefield Post of the Veterans of Foreign Wars has made available to the Chicago Civil Defense Corps facilities of its headquarters. And it says here, a letter acknowledging the post enlistment has been received from Patrick Kelly, coordinator of the Chicago Civil Defense Corps. Uh, no definite date. So you can, so basically, uh, the post proposed program, which will be free and open to the public, will include air raid and atom bomb precautionary measures, first aid treatment in the event of a bombing. Is this is sort of interesting in light of a Mike Ryko anecdote that uh, Marty Quinn. Uh, that they said was kind of a right-hand man, another right-hand man to Daly. They said Daly keeps him around because Quinn will tell him when his flies down. So they had a very a lot of intimacy uh, there, at least in terms of the monitoring of that area of the pants. Uh, Marty Quinn turned on all the air raid sirens in Chicago to celebrate the White Sox winning. I think I think it was the White Sox, and this caused a big panic. And Mike Royko kind of presented it as an example of the exuberance of these kind of um, uh, uh, vi these Dionysian uh, machine guys. Uh, so, yeah, but then it's, like, kind of weird, man. It kind of reminds me of this, like, did he go and... The, the Civil Defense Corps is all mixed up with the air sirens. So is that, is that, is that a part of it, like, that he's got a... He's got the Civil Defense Corps kind of um, involved in the air sirens, so he can just tell them all, oh, it's because of the White Sox, and then it's kind of like they're in the know, and they know what's going on, and then everybody else is freaking out who's not kind of getting their information from the Civil Defense Corps. All right, Civil Defense activities being speeded. Area Warden appointed. VFW distribute 15,000 letters here. Announcement was made this week of the appointment of Edward Klein the Chicago, by the Chicago Civil Defense Corps as Warden of Area 94. So men wishing to volunteer for service as block wardens may phone him at said R. Crest. So this is this is kind of like the turning of the hike hypercube, right? Because the precinct captain runs a precinct, right? And they are basically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the bad shaman uh, surveilling the spirits in the jungle to make sure that the vibes stay fucked. 
And now you've got an overlapping jurisdiction of a civil defense block warden who's also kind of like responsible for what are people thinking about on that block? Are they thinking about defense? Are they thinking about the chemical weapons? Are they thinking about a biological vector of attack? Have they considered uh, how much time they have to get to a bomb shelter when the air raid drill is activated? You know, have they considered they only have eight minutes? They know that the uh, White House security line is monitoring all radar blips. Uh, I don't know. You know, but it's like it's another reactionary organization that seems to have some overlap and interlock with the Democratic Party. Uh, it says here, direct contribution of the civil defense effort. Greater Pullman Post number 2240 VFW is providing 15,000 letters, which will be distributed to all homes in the community within the next several weeks. These letters giving information as to protective measures to be taken in the event of an air raid or other emergency will be distributed by Boy Scouts. DC was also a Boy Scout. So again, we kind of, I feel that I did a, you know, a pretty good job looking at what, not just like, oh, the democratic machine is so, uh, uh, like evil and, and they're doing all these crimes and look, Gacy was a precinct captain. What does that tell you? You know, I looked at Gacy's role in the machine, you know, and, and how does it fit with their general way of doing things? Uh, and I think that's what we need to do with the civil defense. What was Gacy's role in the civil defense? It's probably not going to be in the papers. Uh, maybe this guy, Barry Bashelli knew Gacy as a youth. Maybe he might have some insight into it. Uh, I read his, bought his book and, and read it. Uh, I might reach out to him. This is Barry Bashelli, by the way. Um, kind of an abrupt transition. But he was Gacy's childhood friend. And his father was uh, kind of, uh, he's, he says that his father was an abusive alcoholic uh, that was friends with Gacy's father. And uh, the, the book is, uh, is a per very personal memoir uh, of, of his childhood and, and some, of the, um, some of the positive experience, the highlights. Um, there's, there's a really uh, kind of surreal anecdote about they were in a, a basement that was filled with clocks and there's only one light and the only light switch was at the top of the stairs. So as a, on a boy scout trip or no, it was a trip to Springfield. Oh, and I couldn't figure out who John Gacy's, uh, aunt's nephew was Mary and Gacy's nephew, uh, arranged a tour of uh, Springfield State House, according to Barry Bichelle. I couldn't figure out who they were. That's something I'd like to figure out. Maybe I could ask Barry about it when I, when I get out, get around to reaching out to different people for the podcast. But uh, he relates a story about being in the basement and the parents turn off the light and they can't sleep. And then he's, the clocks are going off and they're freaking out. And, and then uh, AC starts joking and calms him down. And they said they laugh themselves to sleep. So laughing to sleep in the, basement full of clocks with john wayne gacy as a boy very surreal shit so i got mad respect for barry bashelli and uh in terms of the um critical information for this kind of investigation i'm doing it was uh there was quite a bit of that too and, and i'm gonna get into it so his father's name was eugene raymond bashelli and his father was a uh they call him a bartender in the newspaper. He was more like a bar manager. It sounded like my father liked to entertain people with his magic tricks. He would remove any type of watch off your wrist without you knowing it. I remember the days when the president of the Belova Corporation would come by the lounge. My father knew him personally, and he would challenge my father to take whatever watches he had on his wrist without him knowing it. So if my father could perform this trick, the president would give him all of the watches he had removed. So we're going to get into a minute that this guy had a, some type of business relationship with John Wayne Gacy. And then the uh, Belova Corporation president has say, this kind of coy, playful relationship with him. And i and, uh, not trying to malign all magicians, but uh, the world of, of stage magic is like uh, almost like an underworld in some ways. You know, you get, you get this guy, Esther Brooks, was into that stuff. These magicians are into some... Some uh, some underworld gray market type shit, you know, and and I don't think I think it's fair to say that not you know this guy didn't get you know he said his father was an abusive asshole anyway, 
and we're going to get into some of the fucked up shit his dad did. Uh, I'm not inherently trying to go against all magicians, but you should not be playing around with that kind of stuff, generally speaking. And then he's got the Belova President Corporation. Was that the extent of their business relationship? Again, this is another path to go down, another thread to try to try to uh, wind. So this, uh, his father, Eugene Raymond Bashelli, uh, gave the adult John Wayne Gacy instructions to punch Barry Bashelli in the face. I opened the door and I couldn't believe that Johnny had finally come to the apartment. Uh, this is, I guess, after they had some kind of falling out in adulthood. Johnny shows up at the apartment. He says, this is from me and your father. Before I could say a word, Johnny doubled up his fist and hit me in the face on the left side. The fuck? What a cruel thing to do. Uh, and then why is he listening to, uh, listening to the father? And then he related another anecdote. Barry Bashelli said that Eugene Bashelli, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry if that triggered the listener. Um, I'm trying to do these content warnings, right? Uh, but the domestic violence trigger right warning right here. Um, Gacy's father, I mean, not Barry Bashelli's father, Eugene Bashelli, basically did the same thing Barry's mother, that, that he said something along the lines of, this is from me, and then punched the mother in the face. And then somehow he got, this was right after Barry Bashelli's mother died. After the funeral, uh, Johnny was at the funeral, kind of, uh, he said that he was wearing a, like a, a very ostentatious suit and looked like a gangster. And then, uh, this guy's a, uh, a magician, sleight of hand guy. And then, you know, the, the CIA, not to, that this is a, not exactly proof of anything, but the CIA does hire magicians to come and train them in sleight of hand. And I think uh, uh, one of the guys who did that was mixed up with Esther Brooks and, and uh, the uh, Resorts International or something like that. And, and that... Um, that woman, thanks from all the memories, writer. So, and this guy was a public figure. He got his name in the paper. Gene Bashelli, a Windy City bartender. He did made a coffin for his beloved Cubs. Uh, apparently, he loved both the Cubs and the White Sox. But he said the Mets beat the Cubs. And so he had a funeral for the Cubs. Pretty macabre. Kind of weird vibe. So... Barry Bashelli in his book, he says that uh, he arrived at his father's lounge as we arrived at, so he was this is an adult, he went to his father's lounge as we arrived at Bruno's, I knew there was something wrong there shouldn't have been anyone there because the lounge was closed on Sundays. I could see Johnny and a young blonde haired boy, they were just finishing up a cementing an area in the basement I still have nightmares about Johnny killing that young boy. So he went into the bar, he says hey you, who's there, who's there? And Johnny says it's me, it's me and then uh, they said, do you have my father's permission to be here? And then he says, yeah, well, just get out of here. Let me do my work or whatever. And then um, that he said that he didn't call his father to find out if Gacy had permission because um, he fell out with his dad after his mom died. And his, his father was very cruel. And uh, this father seemed like the father made pretty good money from the bar, the lounge managing, but he would give the wife a budget that she had to stick to and, and he wouldn't buy. He only bought him the Boy Scout shirt. He didn't buy him the Boy Scout pants, stuff like this. Kind of financial abuse. So, um, what about Gacy cementing the floor? So Gacy uh, buried a body under his house, under cement. Uh, I think some, that, that someone complained that the body was stinking and so he put a cement block on top of one of the bodies he buried. Uh, I think he, he also... Uh, yeah, so he that's at least one cement block he buried somebody under. Was Gacy burying someone in the floor of this bar with the father's permission, with some mafia permission? Speculation here. I'd be interested to, to chat with Barry Bashelli. I'm going to have to hit him up for an interview sometime. Oh, uh, in a respectful way, I admire him coming forward and talking about this and sharing this anecdote. But uh, yeah, this kind of fits in with Dave McGowan's theory of Gacy as an entrepreneur of uh, clandestine, d 
disposal of cadavers. So this series, uh, John Wayne Gacy, Devil in Disguise, episode five and six, they get into uh, one of Gacy's employees named Pesky, who worked for John D. Norman, who was sort of an activist for pedophilia. Uh, this one also, they talk about Jim Coral. Jim Coral uh, had a very similar modus operandi to John Gacy. And, and uh, you know, I'm using these cop terms. I don't love the cops, but it, there was a lot of similarities in how they ran their operation. Uh, they both had the handcuffs in a uh, wooden board that they would restrain people to for abusing them. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, you know, this, uh, this is getting to a part there's going to be a running trigger warning. Uh, they also um, used lime when they buried, they buried the people in a common grave, bodies on top of bodies, putting a layer of lime on top of each layer of bodies. And uh, they, um, uh, I, I might be worth looking more into Richard Coral's political connections. But he was, basically had a small business. He worked at a family small business making a candy factory. And uh, he kidnapped all these boys. And he had assistants who were his employees who went and found boys for them. And uh, he was connected, I think, to John D. Norman. Gacy was connected to John D. Mor Mor Norman, who he ran a bunch of fake charities that were sort of fronts for ch uh, child trafficking uh, of Basically, the charity would get the child and they'd send it to a pedophile and they had a catalog of all the people who worked with them. Kind of had some Epstein vibes, too. Pesky uh, worked with uh, Coral. No, Pesky worked with John D. Norman and Pesky worked for Gacy. Uh, uh, Bill Dorsch investigated Gacy. He said there was another burial site at an apartment building Gacy managed uh, on Miami Avenue. And he also, this is a clip from the Marshall Project. He investigated this detective, Guevara, who was framing a shitload of people in the 90s. And the families, again, were very active and trying to get attention for this. It took decades. Uh, uh, this dude framed, like, shitloads of people, like uh, 50 to 100, I think, for murder. Uh, and he had a lot of collaborators and enablers who were all going to skate. And I don't even know, maybe Guevara is going to skate too. I think, I don't think he's so far. He hasn't been punished. They've just exonerated a lot of the people he was involved in prosecuting. So Bill Dorsch did an investigation to see if there was more bodies buried in an apartment building that would track with the thesis of Dave McGowan that Gacy was running some kind of business of body disposal maybe for more people than just himself and his personal appetites. Karen Conti was in those documentaries. She represented Gacy in a death penalty appeal and became convinced that he was part of some bigger network of uh, nefarious activity. Uh, like to get interview here, spoke briefly. Uh, she told me something very interesting, which is that Mark Rothy uh, we haven't quite gotten here yet, but uh, Mark Rossi is one of Gacy's employees. Mark Rossi received the vehicle of uh, Godzik. Gacy killed Godzik and took his vehicle and forged a title transfer. Then he sold the vehicle to Mike Rossi, at least according to Mike Rossi. Mike Rossi was driving around with this person who disappeared his vehicle. And also Mike Rossi was one of the people digging the trenches in uh, under the house with Empty trenches. According to Mike Rossi, he was told to dig trenches in specific locations, and he didn't see bodies getting buried in them. But uh, one of the really weird things that Karen Conti told me is that Ed Hanrahan, uh, who was the Cook County State's Attorney, who uh, whose uh, 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 investigators murdered Fred Hampton, he was like in charge of the team that shot Fred Hampton through the walls of his house, obviously with a lot of support from the FBI. Uh, of intel and whatever else that um this guy defended mark rossi during the gacy trial and then karen said that she recalled mark rossi much decades later when she was researching uh in the 90s or the 2000s but you know like at, at least a decade later and she said that with the same day ed hanrahan called right back 
And so Ed Hanrahan, not only is he a very high priced attorney, which he pointed out that they, that Mark Rossi would have needed money to retain him for all those decades. Uh, Mark, uh, Ed Hanrahan killed Fred Hampton. This is like one of the great crimes against humanity of, of the United States history. And one of the great parapolitical crimes. And one of the great counterinsurgency crimes. So, you know, this is the like some kind of edge of the hypercube that the counterinsurgency face and the John Wayne Gacy face are meeting. And supposedly there's a rumor that uh, Mark Rossi is... This is John D. Norman, real creepy looking guy. So, cavdef.org has a lot of links I haven't really had a chance to go through in depth uh they talk about um Dave Gacy had four employees uh uh David Cr uh, that that were alive at the end David Cram Mark Rossi Pesky supposedly uh and Cram was murdered in the cook county forest preserve very suspicious circumstances supposedly hung himself in the cook county forest preserve what's what the fuck uh rossi uh got prosecuted for um some kind of uh extortion thing with movie theaters uh, i listened to an interview with bill dorsch and he had the info on it then um uh Deep quarry and do yeah, so there's a lot of stuff in here, a lot of leads and loose ends and uh, mainstream, but it's all sourced to mainstream articles, you know. So uh, today we were looking at basically John Gacy's Chicago machine connections, but it intersects with his business connections. It rotates through his police and counterinsurgency connections. Uh, supposedly, Vito Marzullo is the grandfather of Mike Rossi, and he had a ton of clout. I've got the clout. I'm going to have the clout as long as I live. Marzullo is fond of saying. Uh, so they do a little bit of like a genealogy thing where they look at the... Uh, supposedly, yeah, supposedly the cops, the, the cop, she... His mother told police that Mark Rossi was the grandson of Vito Marzullo. It appears to be some kind of uh, not recognized uh child uh situation they used to call it illegitimate or or a bastard but that's not the preferred nomenclature nowadays uh so yeah that's pretty weird uh like i said i didn't get a chance to do enough research to really make some definitive conclusions about john d norman or philip paskey uh i think those documentaries and, and researchers i shouted out did a pretty good job with all that so i'm big them up uh yeah this, oh here we go movie companies six prison terms six men with connections to movie projections union were sentenced to prison this is in mike rossi's section here uh what's this say hanrahan yeah hanrahan is a real really needs his own episode i think in in terms of how did he the, the the his political role what his connections were uh monstrous what he did to fred hampton and it, obviously he it wasn't just him doing it the whole political police apparatus what one might call the deep state was was involved i think uh let's just look at what what it says about hanrahan so what do they say uh mentions that mike rossi had andrew hanrahan for the attorney Cook County State's Attorney Hanrahan ordered a raid in the apartment of Black Panther leader Fred Hampton. Uh, Hanrahan essentially did so on behalf of the FBI. The raid was carried out by Chicago police under the direction of Sergeant Daniel Groth. According to page 204 of JFK and the Unspeakable by Jim Douglas, frequently went on training leaves, quote-unquote, to Washington, D.C., most likely worked undercover for the CIA. Sergeant Groth was one of two Chicago Police Department officers who arrested Tarma Thomas Arthur Valley, the Patsy in the Chicago assassination attempt on JFK. Oh, yeah, that guy, he was a mentally ill man. He kept bragging about how he was going to kill JFK. Uh, 
Bur he was a John Bircher. Um, yeah, this I did not get a chance to go through all this, but cavdef.org is, is a great resource everybody should check out. And, the, you know, this is all sourced, so you can decide how to put this stuff together. Uh, what you want to make of it all. I think that it fits in with the dialectical materialism, historical materialism, the Marxist analysis. My opinion is that, uh, you know, this violence is a business, that there is a uh, monopoly aspect where you get these kind of, um, these, what, uh, uh, the Allen... Alan, uh, what was the guy's name? Let me live Google this. We're almost done here. East, West, Alan, East side, West side, Alan, uh, we're going to, Alan A. Block. Yeah, he talked about the, um, uh, he didn't say power cartel, but it was basically the idea that, that, that organized crime has different rackets, and one of the rackets is power uh, cartelizing political power. And that was a role in Chicago. And among the crimes that they sold impunity for, apparently, was, uh, you know, murdering and sexually abusing uh, teenagers. And that's that's the explanation. And, and Gacy had some kind of pivotal role here. And, and he got exposed. Uh, I guess that he... Uh, but then, you know, it seems like that, I, I think it's fair to judge that there's some kind of controlled demolition of, of the network around him so that he took the whole fall for everything and none of his, uh, partners in crime got nailed, even though this guy, you know, at least Mike Rossi went on to be involved in this movie theater extortion. I did not verify that by going through all the newspaper articles and everything. Bill Dorsch said that on, uh, Ed Opperman's show, so I'm I'm just quoting that. But uh, let's return, let's return to Tesseract, and you know, because um when I was researching this stuff, I did become disturbed, uh, contemplating how the killer clown someone reviled is such a a uh, transgressive and aberrant person could have these verifiable connections to institutions that do harm regularly. And I don't think that we should collapse our understanding of Gacy or of these institutions. You know, what does everybody say? They say, oh, the institutions, everybody in them is doing their best. None of them mean any harm. But there was just some misunderstandings in the way everything worked out, and we need some reforms for the institutions. And then for someone like Gacy to say the man is not a man, he's so different from anyone else that he just needs to be destroyed, and that's it. Uh, just destroy him and just, just be horrified and uh, let him go. And we don't need to... Um, pick whether we're going to have some kind of conservative backlash against the most vile perpetrators or whether we're going to um, kind of have a mishmash of regret about our ultimately un... Uh, what do you call it? So, yeah, some kind of mishmash of, of uh, sad regret about our institutions doing harms without any individual in them meaning harm. You know, we don't need to pick between those extremes. There's a way to integrate that knowledge into one hypercube that morphs, it changes shape, it seems counterintuitive, but ultimately the business violence network is the explanation. And the uh, answer, the business violence network is not more computers for cops or the iSearch database or uh, special police units uh, that you've never heard of, like the MEG. Uh, it's communist revolution. We need to have a society where the workers own the means of production 
and goods are apportioned according to the principle of to each according to their need from each according to their ability you know those should be the core principles uh guiding society and uh yeah i mean we did four hours almost today and uh, i think basically i'm not going to promise a follow-up just yet but there is i mean there's even more to be looked into you know like uh who the fuck is this guy gacy i mean he just it's and like like i said for you're wrong about gacy is not the ubermensch he's not a great guy he is a schmuck at the intersection of a bunch of harmful institutions where probably the most sophisticated people have insulated themselves from responsibility more and uh yeah it is what it is thanks for tuning in to oas info i've been maybe we'll have a theme song one of these days